a hearing on strengthening the aviation workforce, and we have a distinguished panel here. I plan to have the majority of the, cheering, the hearing chaired by my colleague, Senator Duckworth, a pilot in her own right and chair of the subcommittee, and, uh, but I am going to make an opening statement and have our colleagues make opening statement, uh, Senator Moran, and then um, turn it over to her. Yesterday at the FAA Safety Summit, there was agreement that there has been an uptick in safety incidents from near misses to runway incursions. Among the critical action items is ensuing that we increase training to account for human factors in the cockpit and in the control tower. We've always had the risk of human error, but as we bring in new safety workforce, we must double down on the human factors and training. We also must have the right safety equipment to identify and prevent runway incursions and near misses, and these airport surface device detection systems that are deployed at some airports and other technologies like them can help air traffic controllers on track the movement of aircraft on the ground and facilitate communications between the tower and the cockpit. These type of investments are needed for situational awareness and to prevent incidents or accidents. So the FAA, I believe, must move forward with these safety upgrades. Um, as Captain Jason Ambrosia can tell us, this means having also enough qualified and talented individuals trained with the most up-to-date expertise in every work group, not just the pilots. The FAA workforce must keep pace too, and that's what we're here to discuss this morning. We must continue to invest in an FAA that has 45,000 employees, including 14 thousand air traffic controllers, 5,000 flight standard workers, and 1,500 aircraft certification personnel. So I look forward to hearing from David Spiro, representative of the FAA safety profession, on this issue. And from airlines to airports to aerospace manufacturers, Americans go to work each day basically depending on these individuals. According to the FAA, aviation contributed to more than 5% of our GDP, 1.9 trillion in total economic activity and supported 11 million jobs. The, ranking, the subcommittee uh, ranking member, Senator Moran, knows this well. He and I work um, on a lot of issues trying to train and skill a workforce for tomorrow. And as this footprint continues to grow, we see the economic opportunities for our nation. According to the Department of Transportation, the U.S. airline industry employed 787,328 workers in January of 2023, nearly 8% more than the pre-pandemic time period of 2019. The U.S. aircraft manufacturing sector is expected to hire more than 10,000 workers in 2023 a production, as production increases continue to rise. And careers in this field offer highly skilled, good-paying jobs with an average salary um, over 106,000, about 40% above the national average, according to the Aer Aerospace Industry Association. So we're proud of this talented workforce, particularly in my home state. The state of Washington is home to more than 100 and 30,000 aerospace workers, and the supply chain that works with more than 1,500 suppliers. With post-pandemic aviation growth, we now face new challenges, and we need to develop a pipeline of qualified workers to replace those who either retired or voluntarily left the workforce during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the next 20 years, to meet projected growth in commercial aviation, we will need 120 8,000 pilots, 134,000 maintenance technicians, 173,000 crew members in North America alone. So big opportunities for us to skill and train a workforce for the jobs of tomorrow that are already here today. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how we can expand access to aviation jobs through all parts of America. Now more than ever, we cannot afford to leave good talent on the table. Dr. Bechtry Lute will tell us about women and people of color and how they're still underrepresented in aviation careers and that bridging this gap to, is a key to ensuring a strong aviation system and certainly making education, pilot uh, access to that diverse workforce more affordable so that they can get the skill set of the future. Women represent roughly 5% of airline pilots, less than 12% of aerospace engineers, 
and yet make up 47% of the total workforce. So we got to bridge the gap, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. I want to thank Ms. Von Mulholland for being here um, from Alaska Airlines. Uh, we talked last week, and she had a very compelling story about her own career and what they are trying to do to meet the gap locally in the Pacific Northwest. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, less than 15% combined, uh, com combined of pilots and engineers are of, uh, uh, black or Hispanic or, or Asian. And uh, we are going to hear about what we can do to build this pipeline for the future. Um, the cost of flight education, as I mentioned, is one of those barriers. A traditional four-year institution can range past $100,000 subject to rising tuition fees. And that is why we need to consider policies that will help drive down those costs and get more students into the aviation talent pool. In 2018, we led efforts here on an FAA grant program uh, to help develop a more inclusive talent pool of aviation pilots and aviation technicians. And today, I have letters for the record from two recipients of the 2023 FAA Workforce Grant recipients in the state of Washington. Aviation Technical Services in Everett and Red Tail Hawks Flying Club in Muckleteo, part of the Black Pilots of America. This funding will help Aviation Technical Services develop and train new airframe mechanics and support military veterans transitioning to a civilian workforce. And it will enable Red Tail Hawks, a flying club, to help underserved and underrepresented students access aviation education. These Washington State organizations are, are training the next generation of aviation professionals, and Congress should consider more ways to build up this successful program. I think we'll also hear about how the ROTC could play a very vital role, too. And uh, we should uh, consider that. So strengthening our aviation workforce, uh, having the right people, having the right skill sets, making sa safety in aviation the number one priority that is what we're here to discuss this morning. So thank you to all the panelists. And now I'll turn it to Senator Moran. Uh, Chair Cantwell, thank you very much. I'm, I'm excited about this hearing. Uh, recognize its value and importance. Know that we have uh, a lot of expertise in the room. Uh, I think this country and certainly the state of Kansas, the state of Washington, is poised for further growth related to aviation and aerospace. Uh, and the limiting factor is uh, highly motivated, trained, and educated workforce. So we have our work cut out for us, and you outlined the statistics that demonstrate uh, how, how much opportunity uh, and how much challenge we have. Um, during the 2018 um, FAA reauthorization, Congress worked to address this issue by creating the Aviation Workforce Development Grant Program, aimed at strengthening the pool of pilots and aviation maintenance uh, and technical workers. A total of $10 million in grants was awarded, more than 20 recipients, but the demand sought by all those applicants was over $120 million. Industry, academia, and Congress all recognize that in order to remain a global leader in aviation, we must have a strong workforce. I'm honored to lead the hearing today and gain insight into how Congress can continue to support the growing demands in this workforce, particularly as we pursue the upcoming FAA reauthorization legislation. I'd like to give particular welcome to one of the witnesses here today, Dr. Sherry Utash, uh, president of Wichita State University's Campus of Applied Sciences and Technology, or WSU Tech. Dr. Utash has served in her position as president for almost a decade, overseeing the college's transition from Wichita Area Technical College to WSU Tech, our state's largest technical college. WSU Tech's commitment, to specializes, uh, commitment specializes in the delivery of career technical education while driving economic development within the region and meeting the current and future workforce needs of the industry. Dr. Utash oversees an innovative partnership and solutions to building a talent pipeline titled Get to Works, uh, Works W-E-R-X. Uh, this program offers students full-time paid employment within the maintenance, repair, and overhaul sector while simultaneously processing through WSU Tech's Aviation Maintenance Technology Program. Dr. Utash offers a unique perspective with experience in teaching and working in both higher education and private industry, and she's helped uh, combat workforce challenges in our state, and we appreciate her very much, and I look forward to hearing what she would have for advice to me and my colleagues. Uh, aviation is one of Kansas's, I'm sorry, is one of America's, that's an easy slip for me, 
Uh, aviation is one of America's top industries, and in Kansas, aerospace and aviation makes up nearly 20% of our state's exports. Wichita, also the number one aerospace manufacturing metro uh, in the nation. Our nation and state's success within this vital sector depends upon those who train, educate, and prepare our students to be ready contributors within the aviation industry. In order for our nation to continue leading in aviation, it will take innovative programs like those Dr. Utesh has helped implement. Uh, I look forward to hearing from her today and all of our panelists, and uh, I look forward to working with you all as we uh, work to reauthorize the FAA. And Madam Chair, I would take this as an opportunity to thank you again and thank you publicly in, in this uh, sec uh, setting. AMJP, uh, Senator Cantwell was hugely uh, necessary, engaged, and a willing partner uh, as we passed aviation manufacturing jobs protection during COVID, which created the opportunities for us to not lose, but to maintain our workforce during a very challenging time in the aviation and aerospace industry. Uh, that legislation, its success would not have been possible without Senator Cantwell, and I remain very grateful to her for uh, her assistance. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, and I thank you, Senator Moran, for working with me on that in the... Uh, COVID uh, program and the, and the ensuing challenges that we faced in actually getting it over the goal line. But I think once we did, we realized how much the supply chain itself benefited from keeping those jobs. And now as we see uh, companies advertising on TV for workers and the challenges we face, I'm glad we kept every one of those jobs that we could. I'll now turn it over to our uh, chair of the subcommittee, and thank you so much for, again, uh, chairing this hearing and for your insights and leadership on this important issue. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your leadership on this, and uh, it's so important for us to get FAA reauthorization done, and this is an important hearing on that path. Also, thank you to Ranking Member Cruz uh, for uh, helping with this hearing as well. Coming out of the pandemic, our aviation system faces a lot of challenges. Yet, when considering the future of American civil aviation, success or failure may ride on whether we're able to dramatically strengthen our nation's aviation workforce over the next five years. Without a properly trained, equipped, and compensated workforce, the safety of the flying public will be put at risk, and the delays we've experienced over the past few years will seem mild by comparison. As a pilot, I want to reiterate my strong support for the post Kogan air safety reforms, especially the 1500 hour rule, and express strong opposition to any proposal that would weaken safety standards in a misguided effort to address workforce challenges. As Captain Sully Sullenberger recently noted, if we were trying to increase the number of physicians serving rural areas, we wouldn't dream of cutting the length of medical school from four years to two years for doctors who serve those communities. Madam Chair, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to place a copy of Captain Sully's March 2nd, 2023 op-ed from the Chicago Tribune into the hearing record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. Captain Sullenberger's voice rightly carries a significant weight in safety debates, and his name is associated with the miracle on the Hudson. But in the context of the 1,500-hour rule, it's worth highlighting two additional figures, 20,208, that demonstrate why Captain Sullenberger's heroics were less a miracle and more a reflection of why hard-earned pilot skills and experience is so important. On that fateful day in January, Captain Sullenberger and his first officer had a mere 208 seconds between losing thrust and landing in the Hudson River. Fortunately for the 155 passengers on board, both Captain Sullenberger and First Officer Jeff Skiles had an accrued 20,000 hours of flight time prior to that extreme emergency each. Their combined 40,000 hours of actual flight time contributed to their swift and coordinated response. Of course, safety does not begin or end in the air. We must also make safety our top priority for flight attendants, gate agents, and other frontline aviation workers. The number of unruly passengers reports came down from in 2022 from an all-time peak, but they remain too high. There were nearly 2,500 unruly passenger reports last year alone. A few weeks ago, a passenger on board a United Airlines flight from Los Angeles to Boston tried to stab a flight attendant with a metal handle of a broken spoon. A year ago, a Southwest Airlines passenger was arrested for assaulting a gate agent in Atlanta after his behavior on board the aircraft during taxiing forced the aircraft to return to the gate. Such abuse is disgusting, disgraceful, and must end. Madam Chair, 
I would like to ask unanimous consent to place a copy of a statement of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA, prepared for this hearing into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. We must also ensure that our supply of aviation workers keeps pace with increasing demand, especially for pilots and mechanics. A recent study projected that the supply gap of aviation mechanics in North America could reach more than 40,000 over the next four years. The, estimate, the study also estimates that up to 35% of the current aviation mechanic workforce is already between 55 and 64 years old. Having just turned 55 last week, I don't think that's that old, but you know. In the 2018 FAA reauthorization bill, Congress established an aviation workforce development grant program at the FAA to enhance public investments in institutions that train future pilots and mechanics. Measured by demand alone, our program has been a smashing, a smashing success. In fiscal year 2021 alone, applicants sought a total of $121 million in grant funding. Unfortunately, measured against our goal, strengthening our aviation workforce, the actual grant funding amount of $10 million failed to meet the real-world demand of $121 million. Fortunately, there is strong bipartisan support for dramatically boosting investments in programs that seek to train our nation's next generation of pilots and mechanics. For example, together with my subcommittee ranking member, Senator Moran, we developed and introduced a bipartisan Aviation Workforce Development Enhancement Act late last year. Our legislation would triple investments in grants that support efforts to train pilots and mechanics while creating a new grant for programs that train aviation manufacturing technical workers. Senator Klobuchar, Thune, and Kelly and Fisher have also developed bipartisan proposals that seek to increase and broaden aviation workforce investments. I am optimistic that working together in a bipartisan way, we will craft a proposal that combines the best elements of our respective bipartisan bills to ensure the forthcoming FAA reauthorization will empower our nation's civil aviation system to build strong, a strong pipeline of pilots and mechanics over the next five years. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about what Congress can do to strengthen our aviation workforce. Thank you. That ends my uh, uh, opening statement, and I would like to move on to introducing our panel. We have with us uh, Constance von Mullen. Uh, nice to have a fellow rotor head in the room. I think we may have been at flight school at the same time. Um, she is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Alaska Airlines, SeaTac, Washington. Dr. Rebecca Luti, Associate Professor, University of Nebraska, Om Omaha Aviation Institute, Omaha, Nebraska. Captain Jason Ambrosi, President, Airline Pilots Association, and he's based right out of here out of Virginia. David Sparrow, National President, Professional Aviation Safety Specialist, AFL-CIO, welcome. Dr. Cherie Utash, President, Wichita State University Campus of Applied Sciences and Technology, thank you for being here today. And Raman Ramanathan, Partner, Ernst & Young, America's Aerospace and Defense Leader. Again, thank you for joining us. And we will begin uh, by recognizing um, Constance von Mullen for her opening statement. Good morning, thank you. Thank you, Chair um, Cantwell, Chair Duckworth, Ranking Member Moran, and distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on this important topic. My name is Constance von Mullen. I am the Chief Operating Officer of Alaska Airlines. I'm proud to represent our company and our 23,000 employees ac across Alaska Air Group, 14,000 of whom are represented by senators on this committee. I was proud to be a member of the FAA's Women in Aviation Advisory Board. Alaska Airlines is the fifth largest carrier in the US, and our success is fueled by our people. Thank you to our remarkable Alaska Airlines employees for the work they do every day to operate safely and reliably while delivering the caring service we're known for. We're passionate about our guests, our airline, and about aviation. We provide caring service to 120 exciting destinations like Payne Field to Las Vegas, Anchorage to Maui, and San Diego to either Boston or Bozeman. Um, I started my career 30 years ago um, as an officer in the US Army, uh, flying Black Hawk helicopters uh, and leading flight operations throughout the world. Our team was made up of people from every possible background, still, we found a way to come together and to achieve our goals under rigorous circumstances. And that is something I hold on to because we built, what we, we built on what we had in common. That's the perspective that I bring as we work to solve the big challenges fa facing aviation today. 
I believe in building collaborative career pathways that build on relationships between airlines, government, the military, manufacturers, and schools of all sizes. A strong aviation workforce is what enables safe and reliable operations, and that's something I have been passionate about, about throughout my career. In my role at Alaska Airlines, I'm responsible for delivering performance in the day-to-day -day operations on the ground and in the air. My objectives fall into three categories this year. Elevating safety, building resilience, and enabling growth. Alaska Airlines is an industry leader in safety. It is our top priority along with our top value. And this applies to our workforce strategy as well because our workforce enables safety. Our safety program is rooted in what we call Ready, Safe, Go. Only after we've ensured that we are ready and able to deliver safely do we proceed with the operation. And in fact, every one of our employees is empowered to stop our operation. Resilience means having the equipment and the staffing to deliver a safe and reliable and on-time operation. This past year, we updated five labor contracts to ensure our employees re receive market wage rates and to recognize their valuable contributions. We finished 2022 with on-time performance and completion rates near the top of the industry as we have for the past 15 years. Finally, enabling growth. Enabling growth is based on a strong workforce pipeline. We must have an inclusive approach to expanding and diversifying talent pools, especially for maintenance, pilot, maintenance technicians and pilots. As we plan for the future at Alaska Airlines, we have established a handful of programs to that end. One is the Ascend Pilot Academy, where enrolled cadets are eligible for low interest financial assistance and a stipend of $26,000 upon um, signing up to Fly for Horizon, our regional ca carrier. We expect to graduate 250 pilots a year out of that program. The Maintenance Technician Development Program provides a $12,300 stipend and reimbursement for employees who wish to shift their career to become a, a, a technician. Last year, our first person completed this program, Kyle. Kyle is a Alaska native who joined Alaska Airlines on the ramp as a ramp service agent in Juneau. And after two years of training while working at our airline, he is now a line aircraft technician in Anchorage. A success story. As we look to grow our workforce, one significant barrier to entry is pilot costs. Offering low interest federal loans to students entering this critical profession is key to improving access to the pilot pipeline. This is a policy we urge Congress to explore and advance so we can have the pilot supply needed to meet the demand in the long term. Congress should also expand the breadth and investment of this Section 625 grants for outreach, education, and training of pilots and maintenance technicians, as well as pave the way for veterans to enter aviation careers through the GI Bill. Thank you. I look forward to working with this committee on enhancing and developing the safest and strongest aviation workforce for our common future. It will take the industry, government, and educators collaborating to accomplish this mission. Thank you. Um, I now recognize Dr. Luti. Thank you. Chairperson Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, Chairperson Duckworth, Ranking Member Moran, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Becky Ludi. I'm a commercial instrument rated pilot, flight instructor, and an aircraft owner. I'm also the distinguished professor of aviation at the University of Nebraska at Omaha Aviation Institute. My research concentrates on aviation workforce with a focus on women in aviation. And I was a member of the FAA Women in Aviation Advisory Board, which served from 2020 to 2022. The board thanks the members of Congress and their staff who championed establishing the board in the 2018 FAA Reauthorization Act to develop recommendations for encouraging more women to pursue careers in aviation. To meet the challenges of today and tomorrow, including workforce, aviation must attract and retain the best possible talent from the widest possible pool. Women make up half the workforce, yet for decades, the introduction of women into the aviation industry in nearly every functional specialty has been relatively stagnant. 
Aviation is fundamental to the U.S. military, transportation infrastructure, and economy. In rural communities, aviation provides crucial transportation and access to supplies, in addition to quality jobs. We must not take for granted the industry's continued strength and success. According to forecasts over the next 20 years, worldwide we will need 602,000 new civilian pilots and even more maintenance technicians. This projected shortage of maintenance technicians has been labeled a talent crisis. Workforce needs also extend to the development and integration of new entrants, like uncrewed aerial systems and advanced air mobility. An obvious strategy to address workforce needs is identifying and recruiting talent from underrepresented groups. In most aviation occupations, women make up less than 20%. Of the world's top 100 passenger airlines, only seven are led by women. Women make up only 5% of airline pilots, and the largest gender gap in the industry is in maintenance, where just under 3% of technicians are women. To meet workforce needs, aviation must expand the pipeline. We can do this by addressing systemic barriers to talent. The board found there's a complex system of barriers impending recruitment, retention, and advancement of women in aviation. The barriers start with a lack of early awareness and compound to include deficient engagement, cost issues, inadequate work-life balance, lack of role models, and negative workplace culture, including harassment, impacting both recruitment and retention. In a 2018 survey of women in aviation, 71% of respondents reported they had experienced sexual harassment in aviation. The good news is that these barriers are not inherent, but rather the product of a system we have built. We can change this system, and if we do, we'll make it better for everyone. The board's 55 recommendations seek to do just that. They're broken down into five key areas. First is culture, which underlies most of the board's recommendations. Changing culture is a long-term commitment, and no single individual or entity is responsible for it. For this reason, the board urges Congress to establish a permanent advisory committee to ensure sustained focus and coordination. Recruitment recommendations increase essential early exposure to aviation through improved outreach and educational opportunities, such as a virtual resource center, a one-stop shop, with information about careers and resources. Recruitment recommendations also target significant cost barriers through new funding avenues. Recommendations for retention center on creating improved family-friendly policies and mentoring talent. These ensure that women not only remain in the pipeline, but are set up for long-term success. Advancement recommendations seek to propel women into essential leadership roles by improving professional development and sponsorship opportunities. And finally, data recommendations will identify and remove data gaps and track progress, including the effectiveness of the board's recommendations. I'm hopeful. In my over 30 years in aviation, I've never seen so much momentum to expand the aviation workforce. We're seeing vibrant and scalable initiatives from industry, the FAA and Congress, to better reach underrepresented groups. Congressional support for the board's recommendations in collaboration with the FAA and industry and with support from a permanent board will further propel aviation forward and create a stronger industry. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Captain Ambrosi. Thank you, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, Chair Duckworth, Ranking Member Moran, and members of the committee for holding this important hearing. My name is Captain Jason Ambrosi. I'm an international captain on the Boeing 767 and president of the Airline Pilots Association. It's an honor to be here today representing more than 67,000 airline pilots who fly for 39 U.S. and Canadian airlines. The United States aviation workforce is strong and resilient. Thanks to the leadership of this committee and the payroll support program, there are enough pilots to meet passenger and cargo demand. I experienced the pandemic as a frontline aviation worker. I can attest to the fact that decisions made during COVID to bump pilots to smaller aircraft, park aircraft, furlough and place pilots on inactive status created a significant training backlog. When demand and subsequently growth returned more quickly than some airlines anticipated, most of these pilots had to be retrained. 
This necessary process is time intensive and expensive. It also relies on a training for footprint that includes personnel and simulator devices and was not designed for a global pandemic of this magnitude. The good news is that we have more pilots available now than before the pandemic. So this temporary backlog will resolve itself as airlines get caught up in pilot training. With the recovery, and thanks to this committee's actions during the pandemic, airlines are hiring pilots as companies expand market share and networks. These actions have further complicated the current labor market by creating attrition with pilots moving between airlines. And pilots are also leaving airlines that offer less attractive careers for those that provide good paying jobs and better quality of life. But this too will resolve itself with time because both because regional pilot contracts are improving and because mainline hiring will stabilize. Airlines make market-based deci business decisions every day. Unfortunately, this includes decisions to pull service from some small and rural communities you represent. Pilots do not make these decisions. However, we stand ready to support the committee in making reforms to essential air service programs because we believe all Americans deserve safe, reliable air service, including those in small and rural communities. That said, we should not now or ever consider lowering safety standards to deal with a training backlog, attrition, or business decisions that airlines make to leave particular markets. As an airline captain, I can tell you that before the current first officer certification and training requirements adopted in 2010, many new pilots who entered my flight deck required on-the-job training. This is a period in aviation history that we should never repeat, not if we want to keep America's skies the safest in the world. Since Congress passed the FAA reauthorization bill in 2010, passenger fatalities have gone down by 99.8%. Clearly, the current pilot training requirements are saving lives, and we should reject any effort to undo them. In fact, our extraordinary aviation safety record and enviable safety culture has made being an airline pilot one of the best careers in this country. It's a great time to be a pilot. Current data tells us that the number of pilots working for U.S. passenger airlines actually rose 5% from 2019 to 2022. And while this is encouraging, we should not lose focus on continuing to maintain and grow a robust pilot pipeline. The airline industry must offer strong and stable careers to individuals from all backgrounds and protect U.S. airline employees from efforts to undermine their rights, including insisting that the Department of Transportation consider and abide by the public interest requirement and enforce aviation workers' rights. Congress has a unique opportunity in this year's FAA reauthorization to build on the strength of America's aviation workforce maintain safety and open the doors of opportunity for all of those who aspire to fly by providing student loans for appropriate flight training programs, establishing grants to build flight training and education degree programs at minority serving institutions, including historically black colleges and universities, increasing funding for workforce development grant program, and making the Women in Aviation Advisory Board a permanent body focused on increasing and supporting women. With this committee's leadership, we have created the safety, safest air transportation system in the world, and with the committee's continued leadership, we can strengthen the U.S. aviation workforce, open the doors of opportunity, and make the world's safest mode of transportation even safer. Thank you. Thank you, and I recognize Mrs. Sparrow. Good morning, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, Chair Duckworth, Ranking Member Moran, and members of the committee, Thank you for inviting me to testify <clears throat> on behalf of the Professional Aviation Safety Specialist, AFL-CIO. PASS represents approximately 11,000 FAA and DOD employees <clears throat> throughout the United States who are tasked with ensuring that the U.S. aviation system remains the gold standard of safety. The largest bargaining unit is the ATO Technical Operations Unit, consisting of technical employees who install, maintain, repair, and certify the radar, navigation, communication, and power systems, making up the air traffic control system. PASS has long called attention to not only the need for sufficient technical staffing, but also the lack of a reliable staffing model on which to base staffing decisions and placement. 
The work of FAA technicians is vital to the safe and efficient operation of the NAS. While keeping the system safe is the number one priority of past members nationwide, the work they perform in-house can also save the agency time and money. Sufficiently staffing this workforce can lead to the upgrade of the NAS in a more efficient and cost-effective manner. To that end, PASS is asking Congress to direct the FAA to establish a technical operations workforce plan and consult with PASS in its creation and implementation. PASS believes that the abilities and skills that tech, op tech ops employees provide, if utilized and staffed properly, can provide a distinct improvement in the implementation of new NAS systems. PASS also represents aviation safety inspectors and other employees within AVS. Aviation safety inspectors in the Flight Standards Service and Aircraft Certification Service are responsible for the certification, oversight, surveillance, and enforcement of the entire aviation system. PASS is extremely concerned about the agency's inability to effectively and consistently staff the FAA inspector workforce. 59% of the Certificate Management Office and 79% of the Flight Standards District Office Managers said in a 2021 Inspector General report that they are understaffed. Among the reasons for this serious level of understaffing are increasing workload, hiring challenges, extended hiring and training periods, and increasing oversight responsibility, including new entrants and the evolving UAS segment. Furthermore, the staffing model currently being used by the agency is insufficient to determine the number of aviation safety inspectors needed. PASS is asking that the FAA be directed to revise its inspector staffing model in consultation with PASS. PASS is also requesting that the FAA increase the number of safety critical positions in flight standards. PASS is currently in contract negotiations on collective bargaining agreements with the FAA for the employees we represent in both ATO and AVS. PASS views these negotiations as opportunities to focus on recruitment and retention of these essential employees. In fact, contract negotiations should serve as the perfect vehicle to promote recruitment and retention efforts. However, I regret to report that little progress has been made, especially when it comes to AVS negotiations. PASS sincerely seeks to assist the agency in maintaining and enhancing its aviation safety workforce, if only the agency was as equally committed. Finally, one of the elements that would help our collective bargaining is having a permanent head at the FAA. In a quote that was attributed to Teddy Roosevelt, he said, the best executive is one who has sense enough to pick good men, pardon the gender, to do what he, what he wants done and self-restraint enough to keep from meddling with them while they do it. I believe Phil Washington has the necessary attributes to succeed as the next FAA administrator. PASS appreciates the opportunity to share information and recommendations regarding the FAA workforce. We stand ready to assist members of Congress as you work toward addressing this important issue. Thank you. We now recognize Dr. Utash for her statement. Well, good morning, Chair Cantwell, Chair Duckworth, Ranking Member Cruz, and Ranking Member Moran. Uh, I'm Sherry Utash, and I serve as the president of WSU Tech and the vice president for workforce development at Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning on behalf of higher education. I also want to thank you all for championing this cause of fortifying our aviation workforce, which is critical, as we all know. At WSU Tech, our National Center for Aviation Training operates a state-of-the-art facility Located on Jabbar Airport in Wichita, Kansas, where over 250,000 square feet of teaching and learning happens for aviation and manufacturing. We design, we build, we fly, we manufacture, we quality, in quality inspection, maintenance, and pilot training, all offering educational workforce development for the aviation and manufacturing industry. Our aviation maintenance program pro provides the opportunity to study in a hands-on learning environment 
combining lectures, hands-on work, and independent projects. The program is rigorous, and it holds students to the industry's highest standards. As a result, it has a national reputation for excellence. In academic year 2022, we had 315 students enrolled in this program. 54 of those were high school students. 10% were female, 30% had racial ethnicity, and 38% were Pell Grant eligible. 92% of those graduates are now working in high demand jobs in aerospace throughout South Central Kansas. In fact, Wichita, the largest city in, which, in Kansas, is recognized globally as the air capital of the world, and it's one of five aviation clusters of the world. The average aviation maintenance mechanic salary in Wichita, Kansas, is $84,000. Approximately 50,000 people work in Wichita's aviation <coughs> manufacturing industry, primarily at the four main aircraft manufacturing plants, Spirit Air Systems, Textron, which is Cessna and Beechcraft, and Bombardier. Additionally, more than 2,500 manufacturing firms operate in Kansas as part of that aviation supply chain. I have long believed that the best three-legged stool to get things done is when government, education, and industry work together in collaboration. The National Center for Aviation Training is a great example of that that opened 12 years ago. It was a result of vision and leadership of each of those sectors coming together to solve a problem, to focus on creating opportunities for productive lives for citizens, and to ensure our country continues to build economic prosperity. I believe those shared values are the guiding principles we need today to meet the challenges and opportunities we collectively have before us to build the aviation workforce for today and for the future. It is both a great responsibility and a privilege to provide educational training pathways for those that are starting their career or those that may be upskilling or reskilling. I always say at WSU Tech, who wouldn't want to be in the life-changing business? Because that's what we're doing is transforming lives. We must continue to build upon this success by building partnerships with industry and becoming more strategic in our recruiting efforts. We have strong partnerships with Spirit Aerosystems, Textron Aviation, Bombardier, and that large supply chain I mentioned that reaches aviation across the globe. We must continue to understand and meet their workforce needs. We also have to recruit differently. We have recently created the Future Ready Center for Aviation and Manufacturing with the state's largest school district where juniors and seniors can begin their technical education career while in high school. We've developed a new earn and learn program, as Senator Moran mentioned, Get to Works, W-E-R-X, with a local maintenance repair operation where students are employed day one and work full time in addition to going to college. The employer pays them a full time wage and benefits in addition to funding their education. This is a great example of our commitment at WSU Tech and Wichita State to students having an applied learning experience so they are engaged in their learning while they're earning in their industry of choice. As I conclude my comments, I want to emphasize again that education, industry, and government all have a role to play in meeting the workforce needs of the aviation ecosystem. Key elements will include, but not be limited to, FAA reauthorization, aviation career awareness of middle school children, the importance of short-term Pell Grants, the continued and increased funding of the workforce grants, and building strategies to encourage diversity in gender, unrepresented pop, underrepresented populations, both economically and of color, and a better transition for our veterans. I want to thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering questions when appropriate. Thank you, and I'm quite patiently, I recognize Mr. Ramanathan. Chair Kentwell, Ranking Member Cruz, Chair Duckworth, Ranking Member Moran, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to speak today on the challenges and opportunities to strengthen the aviation workforce. As the Ernst & Young U.S. Aerospace and Defense Sector Leader, I have the honor of working with some of the largest and most innovative aerospace and defense companies in the U.S. to meet their growth, operations, and talent objectives. In my role, I also lead EY's collaboration with the Aerospace Industries Association Annual Workforce Survey. My comments today will include results from the survey, which I asked to submit as part of the written testimony. I should note at the outset that any commentary reflects my personal views and is not intended to reflect the views of Ernst & Young. 
The 2022 AIA Workforce Survey reaffirms the industry's challenges, many of which are well known, some of which have been or will be discussed today by my fellow panelists. Among the challenges presented in the report, I would like to emphasize three today. First, the survey highlights the challenges and drivers of attrition, attraction, and retention. While engineering and technical schools are generating new talent, a sizable portion of this talent is lost to other industries such as technology, which offer higher compensation, faster career progression, enhanced flexibility, and other benefits. The challenge to attract and retain talent is more pronounced in the lower tiers of the aerospace supply chain that deliver components and parts to aircraft and other subsystems in the aircraft. Second, the survey points out the need for talent to be upskilled and reskilled to support the aviation workforce of the future. Currently, there is a gap within the workforce's current capacity and capabilities, which is exacerbated by the evolution of the desired skill sets required for the future. These future skills include more digital, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, and automation capabilities. Third, competitive pressure in the aerospace industry is growing around the globe. European aerospace companies continue to expand their share and content on global aircraft market, which helps them fund new aircraft and technology development. Asia is accelerating the growth and maturation of its indigenous aerospace industry with advances in airframe, propulsion, avionics, and aircraft systems, and will have competitive offerings in the future. Regions and countries that have a ready and capable workforce will have a competitive advantage. The enduring success of our aerospace industry has been the steady stream of top-tier talent from every corner of the country. To retain the lead, aerospace needs to grow the ability to attract and retain this talent in the face of intense competition from other sectors. As the survey shows, companies are adapting to the challenge by offering more flexible working models and growing more diverse to leverage new talent sources. The survey also informs more can be done. For example, support the efforts to build excitement in the commercial aerospace industry. Industry observers believe that there are at least two broad areas that can drive excitement. Next generation transport aircraft for medium to long range travel, perhaps using conventional architecture, but using advanced technologies. And advanced or urban air mobility involving newer architectures and the supporting infrastructure. Both areas offer opportunities for innovation and experience around opportunities for talent to make an impact, to make a difference. We recognize that Congress is having debates around some of these topics. We believe Congress's focus on attracting and reskilling the workforce of the future is a worthwhile endeavor. Another example, enable the expansion of eligible workforce pool. This could include facilitating access to other talent pools across various geographies, demographics, industries, and promoting efforts to create access for education for early career professionals and reskilling for mid-career professionals. I applaud this committee for engaging on aviation workforce issues during such a critical time. As the US shifts from a COVID-centered footing and the demand for commercial aerospace talent is surging back, air traffic has begun to return. IATA January press release shows that the global domestic passenger traffic is at 97% of 2019 levels and international traffic is at 77% of 2019 level and growing. While we may not have a demand problem, the survey indicates that we do have a workforce supply problem. The discussion to strengthen the aviation workforce is a vital part of the aerospace industry's future. I'm honored to join you here today. Thank you. Thank you, and without objection, we will include the survey results that you mentioned for the record. I now recognize myself um, for the first line of questioning. Um, Dr. Luti, thank you for your service on the Women in Aviation Advisory Board. I find it incredibly frustrating that only 2.6% of aviation mechanics in the United States are women. And that representation of women as a percentage of the total number of aviation maintenance technicians has barely budged over the past decade. We just aren't making the kind of progress that we need. And, and it, it's even more discouraging that this is happening when we face such an acute need to grow the workforce. 
I know how critical it is to conduct outreach to young women while they're still in school to help broaden their horizons and hopefully inspire and prepare this, these young Americans for potentially high paid careers in aviation mechanic work. Um, the Aviation Workforce Development Grant Program provides funding for this type of outreach of education. Dr. Luti, could you explain the return on investment that Congress could expect if it dramatically increased Aviation Workforce Development Grant Program funding to meet industry demand and help broaden outreach to more Americans, particularly young women? Certainly. Um, absolutely. Maintenance is definitely a clear area, as we talked about earlier, of talent crisis. So as mentioned, you know, 3% of maintenance technicians are women. Um, I will say there's a slight bit of good news on that front. So the most recent ATEC report that came out had the number, uh, the percentage of graduates from aviation maintenance technical schools at 9%. So Ooh, we've doubled. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's triple, but we're still in the single digits. Yep. Um, and one of the things that came out of that report that was very disturbing to me also is that only 42% of the graduates from these schools are actually going on and doing the AMP certification. So although it's 9% graduates, that's not really going to convert to a, a big increase in, in women in maintenance numbers. So workforce development grants are something that we talk about in the board report and highly recommend expansion of workforce development grants as a tool um, to help us draw in and uh, more workforce and a, a broader representation in workforce, in particular women, uh, to the aviation industry. So those grants give us the ability to, as you mentioned, expand in, in um, education and awareness. We know this is a key area, is to get people introduced, women introduced to aviation, particularly at a young age. So over half of women surveyed, for example, in aviation said that one of the major influencing factors for them choosing aviation was getting introduced to it as, as a, a young girl or young woman. So um, it's, it's essential. Workforce development grants give us the opportunity to do that. And they also give us the opportunity to not have to reinvent the wheel. So there are some really great programs that we have for um, outreach for youth. Um, everything from, you know, I, I'm AWAM, but Girls in Aviation Day and Organization Black Aerospace Professionals with Girls Launch, um, Young Eagles, of course, EA. But there's lots of programs that are out there for aviation outreach. And one of the things that the development grants allow us to do is to capitalize on what already exists, expand it, deepen it, broaden it and really have the opportunity to recruit and retain more women into aviation. Thank you. Captain Ambrosi, um, can you give us Alpa's view on this, um, on the return investment in Congress? I'm afraid that we are sending a message um, that workforce, uh, aviation workforce development is a low priority when most applicants don't receive the requested funding. Um, can you speak a little bit about uh, what you think the return on investment would be if we drastically scaled up aviation workforce development grant funding from the $10 million a year it is right now to better approach the scale of need, which seems closer to $100 million a year? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for your question. First, let me thank you for your opening comments on uh, preventing special interests from rolling back safety regulations. But on this topic, ALPA absolutely supports uh, in increasing funding to get uh, women and uh, uh, underrepresented groups involved in aviation. This is a great profession. Uh, it's something to be proud of. We need to reach out to these folks. I have an eight-year-old daughter that I hope has an easier ability to get into this business than, than females in my generation did you know, over 30 years ago when I started in this in this process. So absolutely, we've, we've, ALPA does outreach. We go to everything from elementary schools. We've done over 2,000 visits from elementary schools up to um, higher education. So we're, we absolutely support and believe there is an excellent return on investment. Thank you. Dr. Utash, uh, I understand you sought one of these grants and did not receive it, and that is uh, unfortunately uh, a common experience. Can you speak a little bit about the need to increase the grant program? Certainly, thank you. We have, we have applied uh, the last two rounds, and we have not received it, uh, but I also have reviewed the proposals of those that received, which, you know, absolutely are great um, workforce programs, but I also perused all of the ones that did not receive funding, and so we would absolutely support the additional funding. What, there wasn't a proposal in that, in that group that did not have a good return on investment, in my personal opinion. In ours, what we were trying to do was to, with the recent changes in the FAA regulations for the maintenance program, was to be able to take um, the general part of aviation across the state of Kansas to all of our high schools. There is a, there, that's a broad reach uh, and a, a large net that can be cast. 
And every single one of those um, proposals that I, I perused and looked at, I thought had a great return on investment. So we would highly encourage from education that that, that funding be expanded. Thank you. I now recognize my ranking member, Senator Moran. Uh, Chairwoman, thank you very much. I look forward to continuing to work with you as we have in the past on workforce issues, especially in aviation. Let me ask just a broad question, and maybe this is for Dr. Ludi or Dr. Utash, Mr. Ramathan, Ramanathan. Um, what's the difference between just encouraging STEM education uh, and encouraging aviation education? Um, so we, we spent a lot of time trying to convince uh, women, young students uh, for, to pursue degrees in science, mathematics, engineering, and research. Does that translate into something that matters to aviation? Or does the educational focus need to be specifically toward aviation? Dr. Ludi, you have your head nodding with me. I, <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, to me, personally, it's the passion for aviation. I mean, there's something about aviation that hooks you in, you know, whether it's, you know, with that first time you look up and see the airplane and you know uh, that's your dream and that's what you want to do. Um, I, I just see that in a, in a different way, it probably a little bit of a bias for the aviation bug for me. Um, but in terms of recruiting and retention, I think it's critically important to think about it. Um, we know, for example, from research that young women tend to self-select out of STEM programs. Um, they don't feel necessarily welcome in STEM programs. So I think it's really important in terms of outreach and education and some of the areas that we're talking about here that when we do outreach, we do it from a focus of aviation first, STEM second. If you lead with STEM, you're going to have potentially self-selecting out women or young women from those programs. And that's not what hooks them in. You know, the research shows that what hooks young women into aviation, the number one um, response on a survey of women in aviation was passion for aviation, followed by the desire to be challenged. You know, that's where the hook is. So I think we lead with aviation because we want to send the message that, um, you know, if you're not interested in STEM, aviation isn't for you. That's not what we want to send. We want to let people know, get hooked on it, or you know, if you have the passion for it, um, there's a place for you. So there's a distinction? I believe so, yes. Yes, ma'am. I would add into that, I, I do think there's a distinction. But I think the other thing that's so critically important about this is young children, middle school children, they, don't know, they know what a pilot is, but they don't know what all the other things, you know, you think about um, at, at Alaska Airlines, all the people that make that plane fly, all the people it takes that's in that infrastructure. I don't think people really understand, young children don't really understand what those opportunities are. On a flight I was on yesterday, it was a 45 minute delay because a maintenance person needed to come fix something so that we could go in the air safely. That, we, we have to do a better job because the and, the, and the way it ties in, Senator Moran, to the STEM is that you do have to have some strong science and math skills to be successful. But I think leading with the passion, leading with the, leading with the awareness piece, and then building from there, um, I, I think is a better way to encourage young people in this profession. Mr. Ramanathan, I think you said something about we lose uh, to other industries within the tech sector, aviation workers. Yeah, Senator, I um, concur with uh, some of the panelists, comments, Dr. Utash and Dr. Ludi. I think you need, you know, we like, you know, we're all passionate people in the sector and we like people, you know, to have passion in the aviation sector for sure. But STEM is a building block. I mean, I think the basics of physics, mathematics is a building block. So that definitely helps for somebody to be preparing for an aviation or aerospace professional. Having said that, I think the distinction is a lot of the STEM, you know, we, we do not have a problem in um, um, graduates coming out of, you know, uh, colleges or universities, but a lot of them are attracted to other sectors. So if it's a pure STEM person, could be attracted to other sectors, namely tech, if you will, that offers, as the survey showed, you know, from AIA, that offers higher compensation, flexible working models, and faster career progression versus a, you know, aerospace industry. So a pure STEM person could be you know, attracted to other sectors, whereas the aviation passionate STEM person could be more attracted to stay in the sector. Uh, thank you all for your answers. I'd highlight that uh, next month we'll help cut a ribbon in Atchison, Kansas on a museum honoring Amelia Earhart. 
uh, which I, yeah. and when we've changed out our statue, our state's statue in Statuary Hall uh, to Amelia Earhart. Uh, and again, those kinds of circumstances, uh, perhaps a history lesson allows us to capture uh, people to be interested, and in this case, particularly women, to be interested in careers in aviation and aerospace. Uh, if you have suggestions how we can, they're gonna focus a lot of attention at the museum on STEM, if you can help us uh, figure out how we, based upon our conversation, how we make sure that that STEM that lends itself well to careers in aviation. Uh, I think one of the key areas is just put women in front of um, you know young people. I mean, have people that that look like them as a part of the presentation and a, and a part of uh, the experience. So I think that can be a really powerful thing. It's the see it be it experience, right? So. Um, and, and, and as was mentioned, I think introducing a variety of areas of, of aviation occupations is important as well. So, um, Dr. Ludi, uh, Atchison is only a short distance from Omaha. We <laughs> you bet. To see us. Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I recognize uh, Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Senator Moran. I was a huge fan of Amelia Earhart growing up. It was one of those fourth grade biographies I read over and over again. Um, so I'm excited. Look to, at you today. Yeah, there yes. we go. Well, now I have my new aviation hero in Tammy Duckworth. So there we are. Um, but uh, thank you. And I'm proud to co-chair the Travel and Tourism Caucus with uh, Senator Moran. And so a lot of the issues you've been talking about uh, resonate at home where Minnesota actually um, has 126 general aviation airports that need trained staff. We have our airport was once again voted best in the country uh, in the Twin Cities. And then, of course, we make Cirrus jets and have an air base um, and are really proud of aviation in our state. But we just have a huge uh, workforce issue right now. And uh, that's why I'm working on a number of bipartisan efforts with Senator Duckworth, Thune, Moran, Fisher, and Kelly to expand the FAA's workforce development grant program. This was mentioned. And then Senator Moran and Capito and I have a bill uh, to uh, work on um, um, uh, recommend improvements uh, to future outages, uh, which we don't want to see, and how we bring all the stakeholders there so we move to the next generation of air traffic control is going to be really, really important. Um, so, and I passed a bill on women in STEM um, uh, just because I just see that if we're going to add more workers and more workforce, we don't want to leave our, um, a whole bunch of our workers uh, behind. So, I guess I'd start with sort of the current. Uh, Captain Ambrosi, in your testimony, you state that post pandemic air travel demand returns significantly and quicker uh, than predicted. Um, can you describe what impacts uh, there were on new pilot hiring and training as a result of that uh, demand? Uh, yes, absolutely, Senator. Thank you. Um, as you know, the, the airlines, we didn't know, uh, they, they didn't know that a vaccine was going to happen so fast. And, you know, the, the leadership here on the payroll support program, uh, yeah, they, they, everybody thought that the, they, they were fighting to keep the lights on. So they down, they they probably overreacted in light of it, and displaced and, and bumped people down to smaller airplanes. And it would take so long for us to train back the other way. In the recovery, this, we're still trying to recover from that. Airlines have more pilots. The big airlines have far more pilots than they had pre-pandemic right now, but they're still not operating at that pre-pandemic level. Because of that kind of change in all that all, of all that training is just just takes a huge amount of time to, to go back the other. So, way. how would the additional grant funding help to train new workers um, and to get that expedited? Well, the pilot pipeline is in a good place right now. Mm -hmm. There there are pilots. The there's more flight instructors than there's ever been. The colleges and universities are are full. Uh, but we need to look beyond today or tomorrow and look to the future and, and encourage that next group of, of aviators and a more mm -hmm. diverse background to, to get into it. So yeah. uh, encouraging those folks to, to get involved will, will, will be essential. Dr. Utesh, you want to add anything to that? Well, I would add that we just started a pilot program uh, almost two years ago. Uh, it has been full. It is very popular. Um, but it is very expensive, and it's very hard to braid the funding together in order to offset the tuition and fee cost in addition to the flight cost. Well, and also, as uh, you were pointing out about the bigger airlines and the, the pipeline, we still have a lot of regional and smaller 
airlines um, and the need to make sure that that pipeline is strong. So I, I, I wrote a book on antitrust, which I know you all go home and read now, <laughs> 200 pages of footnotes. Um, but um, one of the things, we don't want to just have consolidation and only big airlines, so that's part of it. Um, Ms. Von Mullen, you began your career um, as an aviation officer, as we know, in the U.S. Army, flying helicopters and leading flight operations. Um, this idea of attracting even more veterans, we're already, I know I've met a lot of veterans who are pilots and in aviation in different ways, um, is certainly part of the solution. What should we do to attract more veterans to consider jobs in aviation? Senator, thank you for the question. Obviously, I'm passionate about uh, veterans, the skills and talent and tenacity veterans bring to all um, who employ them is uh, admirable and really a differentiator. So drawing that talent of folks who have already been exposed to aviation into the airlines and aviation more broadly is critical. What I will tell you at Alaska is we recruit directly at transition events on military basis uh, for both pilots and uh, aircraft technicians, as well as others to lead our ramp to work in our uh, operations center because um, there is already the passion that, that Dr. Ludi was talking about. However, the transition for um, pilots and uh, technicians has to be planned. You have to ensure that you have all your ducks in a row, if I might say, in order to successfully um, get the equivalent FAA certification. So making that process more streamlined is actually um, uh, one of the ways that government can help. Okay, well, I'm out of time. I'll ask you on the record, Mr. Spiro, uh, later about the air traffic control age and the requirement to retire at 56 and just you know, what we should be doing there with air traffic controls. But I, I know you want to answer, but I should defer to some of my colleagues here, and I'll put that on the record. I just want to raise the issue of air traffic control. You want to answer in one sentence? Well, I can't speak to the air traffic controller's uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maximum reti minimum retirement age, but I, I will be able to speak a little more about our aging workforce when it comes to uh, the technicians. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Senator Baldwin was here at uh, Gavel Show. I recognize her next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, Captain Ambrosi, uh, I really want to thank you for coming before the committee on this important topic. Um, I have uh, offered legislation to increase the level of education assistance available uh, for students who wish to become pilots. And I want to thank the Airline uh, Pilots Association for support of this uh, measure, uh, the Flight Education Access Act. Um, I, I certainly hope the committee will uh, include this legislation in our FAA bill as we consider how best to support a strong pilot workforce. Um, but as you well know, the upfront costs associated with becoming a pilot are high. And um, it, however, those who complete the education and training needed are able to access fulfilling and well-paid uh, uh, profession. Um, so I, I would love to have you focus on this legislation um, in terms of how it might lower barriers for those who wish to become pilots. Absolutely, Senator, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. I'll be honest with you, I probably wouldn't be here today if it was this expensive back when I did this, started this process over 30 years ago. Uh, it is expensive and we need other professions, other professional professions can, can access federal student loans. So we need to be able to do that in the aviation community. So we absolutely support that. And it will not only allow, it will allow more adverse workforce as well because it, everybody will have access to that funding. That's great. Um, and and in, with regard to that uh, diversity, um, uh, Ms. Von Mullen, uh, I understand, did you also serve on the Women in Aviation Advisory Board? Yes, Senator. Yeah. I did. The, so the, the report released last year, um, you know, I pointed out uh, that we have a lot more we need to do. And one of the recommendations in the advisory board's report was to increase the level of education assistance for those who wish to become a pilot but may not have the resources needed um, for significant upfront costs associated with the education and training. Um, do you believe this uh, legislation, the Flight uh, Education Access Act, could lower uh, barriers for more women to become pilots? 
Senator, yes. Uh, the key barrier to entry for women and people in underrepresented groups is cost. So therefore, easier access to loans. And as uh, Captain Ambrosi mentioned, uh, broader access to loans is critical to drawing uh, pilots to the workforce, but others to the workforce as well. Yeah, this may be uh, just a, an obvious question, but um, it, we've all talked about the uh, high costs associated with uh, the studies. I, I guess Dr. Ludi and Dr. Yutash, do you want to detail some of those costs? What are we talking about? Is equipment? Uh, you know, we, we, why is it so expensive? What does that? Uh, what, what are the elements of that? Sure, happy to. And I'm, I'm very familiar with the cost because uh, as a pilot myself, but also my son just graduated from our four-year flight training program this August, which I just paid for. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really familiar with the cost. Um, and and um, as mentioned, cost was a factor that we talked about in the board report. It's part of our recommendation. So we're excited to see action um, towards that recommendation from the board report. So the cost, generally, you know, on average, one report says that students get a about $9,000 a year in federal financial aid. So that maybe, probably won't cover the cost, standard cost of, of college, you know, books, tuition. Um, when you add flight training onto that, you're looking at an additional cost of anywhere from about sixty dollars to $80,000 on top of the college degree that you're paying for. Um, so, and that comes in the form of, you know, as you mentioned, the, the breakdown. Certainly aircraft cost, um, instructor costs, and along those lines, you know, with aircraft is insurance and maintenance and, you know, all the work that goes behind it. Um, so it's, as you mentioned, um, it's, it's significant additional cost. It's a barrier to entry. And we absolutely have to expand financial aid for those in flight training if we want to enhance the workforce pool and also bring in more women in aviation. Dr. Yutesh, do you have anything you might want to add to that? Thank you, Senator. I would just add to that. I agree with everything Dr. Luti just said. I would just add to that. In a two-year program, which is what ours is, uh, that cost for um, that pilot program with flight is about in the mid-80,000. And again, that's a barrier for entry. And it's just hard to find braided funding to be able to overcome those costs. The other side of it, it's extremely expensive to administrate. Uh, when we talk about an aviation maintenance program or a pilot program, those are high dollar costs to your educational institutions that offer those programs from a standpoint of the faculty costs, the insurance, the equipment, uh, and, and all the things that go into the infrastructure and buildings to house those programs. Thank you. Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I wanna thank the witnesses particular, uh, Ms. Van Mulen, um, you are a senior executive in our airline, Alaska Airline, that's our state's airline. I know it's headquartered in Seattle, but we consider it our airline. <laughs> so, um, and you're a veteran, Black Hawk pilot, which is very impressive, and Alaska, the state has more veterans per capita than any state in the country. So these are things that should all work together to help us address some of the challenges. So I want to follow up on, first on um, uh, my colleague's question on veterans, and the more we can be doing. You, you actually came through the pipeline as a pilot yourself, and so is there anything more that you want to add to Senator Klobuchar's question and the discussion you had on getting veterans? And of course, we have another Hilo pilot who's chairing, my friend, Senator Duckworth. Um, Blackhawks too, right? Air assault all the way, whoop. All right. Uh, <laughs> I knew she'd do that, uh, which is great. I love it. Um, but. It's a very, it's a match kind of made in heaven, right? Our veterans know how to get up at 4 a.m., be on time, discipline. So what more can we be doing in that area? Senator Sullivan, thank you for your support of Alaska Airlines. We are a, an important infrastructure element to the state and are proud to be that for the last 90 years that we've operated there. It uh, sharpens the skills of our pilots and all our team. To that end, we hire a lot of veterans because of the, as you mentioned, um, 
uh, skills they innately bring to the task. Uh, two things. Uh, one is transitioning from their current work to either becoming a pilot or um, a certificated uh, technician. Uh, getting the FAA equivalent is clunky. And then secondly, I would say so loans, GI look, so loans are um, not at the level that they uh, need to be to, to assist in that transition. So let's dig into that. And maybe for the record, if you could provide or other witnesses here, it's a great panel. That FAA clunkiness, right? We see that all the time. And, you know, if you're like a Motor T uh, military member, and then you, you got to, when you get out, you got to spend, you know, 15,000 bucks to get your CDL, and you're like driving trucks in Iraq, you're pretty qualified, right? But similarly, if there's clunkiness to FAA licensing for our veterans, let's work together on this FAA reauth that we're, in, that we're literally drafting up now to address that. Because these are the kind of things that drive people nuts. If you're doing all this stuff in the military and then you got to get out and they pretend like you're starting from scratch on, the, uh, on, on some of the licensing and other things, we would want to work with you on that. So can, can we maybe, everybody here, if you guys have ideas on how to make that less clunky, especially for our pilots and others, I think that would be really helpful. You guys think that's a good idea? I mean, that's a, we got a pilot shortage. Yeah. Okay, so let's try and do that. Um, by the way, I wanna also uh, express support for Senator Baldwin's um, bill that sh she's working on, my office is working with her on. Do you think that, it sounded like from the last exchange that the idea of um, providing an opportunity for federally funded education programs to ensure flight and aviation um, components to have education and student loans for that is important. Would everybody agree on that? Anyone have additional comments? It's a really important issue that I think can help with our shortages. Senator Sullivan, um, I would just support that tremendously because there is there are there are career awareness, you know, issues that we're dealing with, but there's also financial yeah. issues to get people into the pipeline. And one other comment on your FAA is the Part 65 should be more much more widely publicized from the FAA as a transition for those that are on the flight line. Uh, to an A and P mechanic um, Part 147 license. Well, let me uh, let me ask about that. that. That's a final question I wanted to have. You know, um, I appreciated um, Ms. Van Mulen your testimony. You gave a shout out to one of my constituents from Metlakatla, who recently became an aircraft technician with the help from Alaska Airlines Maintenance Technician Development Program, and has now established a new carrier as a line aircraft technician in Anchorage. Can you um, tell the committee a little bit more about how that program or other programs that enable people to begin? I was actually on Alaska Airlines flight very recently with uh, one of my former Marines. We had a recon unit in Anchorage that um, uh, a great Marine who started, uh, you know, uh, ha handling bags and now is in your uh, one of your top technicians and he's been with Alaska Airlines for 20 years. It was a great chat with him it was just a couple weeks ago on a flight from Juneau to Anchorage. Those kind of programs that help people advance, I would love to hear more about those and from any other witness too. Thank you, Senator, for mentioning we uh, invest uh, $12,300 to support a technician who wants to, or someone who wants to become a technician who's currently uh, working with and for us. So as they continue to work, in this case, Kyle was working on the ramp. Um, he is getting, he got his AMP uh, certificate. Incredible uh, young man who uh, was working while uh, getting his education and got support from us in doing so. We're looking forward to um, uh, expanding this program and also to the extent that the federal government is uh, there to help in expanding that type of program further, really critical because the um, uh, 
pilot and technician jobs are incredibly well-paying and great uh, careers, especially if you have uh, the opportunity to do it in, within the geography that you grow up in, uh, as Kyle did. Great, good, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and now uh, via remote, uh, uh, Senator Markey. Senator Markey, you can, there you go. We couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Please oh, proceed. beautiful. So I just wanted to echo what you have been saying, Madam Chair, that there are critical workforce uh, issues. Uh, uh, diversity is lacking. The numbers are incredible. Less than 20% of aviation workers are women. Less than 10% of pilots and maintenance technicians are women. And workers of color make up less than 10% of pilots and flight engineers. And that just doesn't fly. So Mrs. Ms. Luti, uh, can you briefly describe what your research shows in terms of lack of uh, diversity in aviation in our country? Certainly, I think um, you know you just did a nice job of summarizing some of the data for me, so thank you very much. Um, as you mentioned, you know, there's certainly uh, uh, major gaps um, within uh, for women in aviation and people of color. Um, less than 20% of the workforce uh, overall uh, for women and 5% of airline pilots, 3% of maintenance technicians are women. Um, in addition, you know, you, you mentioned the, the uh, racial uh, gap in the workforce as well. So um, I think you summarized it well. I, I think we also need to address, you know, what the primary barriers are. Um, in order to address those gaps. Um, and what we know is, uh, as has been mentioned, one of the primary um, barriers include things like outreach and awareness and education for young people, getting people informed of how they can become involved in aviation. Um, we have several recommendations, of course, in the board report along those lines. You talk specifically about, um, you know, racial imbalance within the aviation industry as well. Uh, in a survey that was done of the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, they also showed some of the same similar barriers that we found for women in aviation, such as cost, certainly negative culture um, for women, um, bias and discrimination, sexist comments, and in the Black Aerospace Professional group, um, racist comments. Um, so I think those areas are, are key areas that, that clearly we need to address. Um, but cost, um, awareness, and culture are, are three key areas that um, we can address to help improve the um, representation across the board in aviation. Uh, and again, so, that's the way, so that is how you think that women and minorities can be better included by broadening the pipeline by taking the actions that you just mentioned so that we've got a strategy to reach out, to include them, and to help them to make it through the process. Right, exactly. The strategies that we lay out, the 55 recommendations in the board report that will address a lot of those barriers that we just mentioned. Um, another one, by the way, that from the OBAP uh, survey that we did that was interesting was, was just a lack of awareness. Like somebody is interested in the aviation as a career, but they really don't know or they don't have enough information about the pathway forward. You know, how do I find out more about the career? How do I stay engaged? Um, throughout school, or how do we keep young people engaged? And so one of the key recommendations we had in the report was that one-stop shop virtual resource center to help inform and put the information out there so that people, you know, when you get hooked on aviation and you get that passion for aviation, you know what the pathway forward is um, so that we can, you know, better um, help people to find us in the industry and get them where they want to be on their journey. And I agree with you 100%. And that's why I'm working on legislation to create uh, and support aviation programs at minority serving institutions and at institutions focused on increasing racial and gender representation uh, in this uh, area. Uh, and Ms. Sudi, I'm sure you agree that as part of the FAA reauthorization, Congress should include legislation uh, for women and minorities to have them be increased in our nation's aviation workforce. You agree with that? Uh, most certainly. In fact, um, that's good to hear that, that that's being worked on because that literally is our recommendations in action. We have a recommendation specifically about funding for minority serving institutions. Um, as an example, we have approximately, not approximately, we have 107 HBCUs um, in this country, but only eight 
have aviation degree programs with um, four-year degrees. So, so you would support legislation that helped to enhance that. So we need to enhance that. You know, we need to. Okay, we need well, to that's, that, access that will be that will be the legislation that I'm introducing. And uh, and finally, we can't really talk about aviation workforce issues without talking about airport service workers. Uh, those individuals, the wheelchair attendants, the baggage handlers, the concession workers are overworked, they're underpaid. And that's why last week I reintroduced the Good Jobs for Good Airports Act to ensure that airport service workers get a living wage in benefits. I introduced it with Senator Schumer, Senator Blumenthal, uh, and others. Uh, it's just time for us to recognize these hidden figures at airports who showed up throughout the entire pandemic, ran higher risk of getting COVID, uh, and uh, were not properly compensated for what they did. So we just have to move forward, just make sure that they get the funding for their families. Uh, and that as we fund airports, we make sure it goes down as well into uh, that part of our workforce as well. So thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Now recognize Senator Budd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. Uh, the U.S. has the safest and most complex airspace in the world. Keeping in that way requires a lot of talented FAA personnel, engineers, pilots, aircraft designers, and mechanics. We have an opportunity to address these needs in the upcoming FAA Reauthorization Act. One initiative I hope that will be included is the National Center for Advancement Act. And this bill establishes a center to develop the U.S. aviation workforce through collaboration with educators, governments, and industry to provide scholarships, apprenticeships, and up-to-date, real-world focused curriculum. So Mr. Ramanthan, uh, you helped write a report that said defense and aerospace companies are partnering with community colleges and universities to develop deeper talent pipelines. You also found that firms are experimenting with knowledge transfer programs from older to younger generation of workers. So how well is the aerospace industry doing in recruiting and retaining a workforce that can keep pace with technological progress? Senator Bud, thank you for asking the question. Uh, this is very critical for the future of the aerospace industry in the country, so I can totally understand where you're coming from. Um, the industry has made advances over the past several years, and particularly in the recent past, you know, in terms of collaborating better. And these are, you know, trying to go and do internships in universities. And if you look at the survey, it shows that the extent of internships that are sponsored by the companies, you know, aerospace companies have started increasing, you know, compared to the past. You know, is it completely sufficient? Do we have everything that is happening to, you know, uh, to fulfill the needs, you know, of the future aerospace industry? Probably not, but I think it is continuing. Um, so good, but more work to go. More work to be done, mm, you know, good. particularly given the, yeah. the challenges, if you look at it in the future, we have the conventional aircraft, and the associated technology, and we need people for that, you know, both engineers, technicians, because the air traffic, commercial aircraft fleet is bound to increase significantly over the next 20 years, you know, almost about to double. So we need, you know, engineers, we need technicians and all that. At the same time, we've got the newer technologies, newer architectures related to unmanned aerial mobility, you know, advanced air mobility, and that requirements, the skills required for that are quite different from you know, what, you know, the industry is used to. So I think from that standpoint, I think more needs to be done. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Utash, uh, how can technical colleges better partner with industry to attract more students to pursue careers in aviation? Thank you for the question, Senator Budd. I would, uh, I would, I would look at the applied learning model that we have really tried to implement throughout our institution, and that is for students to be able to work in industry while they're receiving their education. So it's a side-by-side. -side. They're earning and they're learning at the same time. But that is, um, you know, that can be challenging for industry and any kind of uh, incentives or any kind of encouragement that could be given to industry to do that is incredibly important. I mentioned in my written uh, testimony a project that we have called Get to Works, W-E-R-X, where we're working with a maintenance repair operation right now. They're hiring students. They go to work day one, and they go to school day two. 
and they have a full-time job with benefits and that employer is paying their tuition. And then they make a two-year commitment to stay with them once they graduate. Those kind of things, the way that we, the way that we integrate education and, and work together so that students can end up as they graduate with a J-O-B and not debt would be great. Very good. Thank you. know, aviation, it just can't work without pilots. Uh, regional airlines are feeling the effects of pilot shortages. 400 regional aircraft are parked because of a lack of pilots, and 226 non-hub and non-primary airports have seen flight loss averaging 32%. So, Ms. Von Mullen, uh, has your airline or its regional partners needed to reduce flights because of a lack of pilots? Senator, thank you for the question. We're committed to all the communities we serve and continue to serve. We understand from our 90 years in the state of Alaska that we're a critical part of infrastructure and, in fact, successful a successful economy, not only in that state, but in every state we serve. So we're committed to uh, continuing to serve the communities we serve today. So in your opinion, how does a pilot shortage impact future growth for the aviation industry? Uh, the... Um, Expanding of the talent pool, drawing more uh, pilots into the workforce is critical because we are facing, like everywhere, an aging workforce. As the workforce retires and we grow, there is no doubt that the numbers in the future will be more than the numbers in the past. Therefore, attracting, training, and retaining uh, pilots is critical. It's very helpful. Thank, the, thank you to the panel. I yield back. Thank you. Senator Rosen, remotely. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Appreciate that. Appreciate uh, everyone uh, being here today to talk about this important topic. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about military to commercial aviation pipeline because Nevada plays a major role in national security and in the aerospace sector. Uh, we're home to Nellis Air Force Base, the Nevada Test and Training Range, Creech Air Force Base, Fallon Naval Air Station, and numerous other equities that engage in aviation. Nellis is seven miles northeast of Las Vegas, covers more than 14,000 acres, and its ranges provide over 15,000 square miles of uninterrupted airspace for flying operations. An estimated 12,000 military and civilian personnel work at Nellis, making one of the largest employers in Southern Nevada. The Las Vegas campus of em Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University also confers undergraduate and advanced degrees in professional aeronautics, space education, systems engineering, and logistics and supply chain management. So Captain Ambrose, can you talk about the importance of the military aviation pipeline into commercial aviation jobs and the resources needed to train military pilots for open civilian aircraft positions? And, and are there existing federal programs we should be leveraging to strengthen the pilot workforce generally and perhaps this pipeline specifically? Well, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, certainly, we could smooth the transition for, for military pilots coming to civilian aviation. There is a process uh, and, and, and pilots are able to work through it. Uh, I, I would encourage that, that this legislation would also encourage veterans that have served our country to also be able that were not pilots in the military to be able to, to get funding to seek uh, getting into good aviation jobs, including pilots, technicians, what have you. But absolutely, we, we support the initiative and uh, we're, we're happy to help. That's a fantastic idea. Um, and I want to build on that because in the past, <coughs> excuse me, ALPA has discussed um, it's just a high educational cost of becoming a pilot and or even some of the supporting jobs and the burden of student loans, uh, particularly for those who haven't served in the military, um, it's, it's often really a barrier. And so um, do you consider this still a barrier? What are the other major barriers, Captain Ambrose, that uh, you feel we have to attracting uh, pilots or training new pilots? Um, uh, and what ways do you think we should be addressing it? It's it's expensive for a civilian uh, the civilian ranks. We've just talked about the military. Uh, many pilots now are are coming through the civilian ranks with less military pilots. So that cost is is uh, enormous. It's an it's a burden as has been discussed by the panel this morning. Uh, increasing the ability for for federal loans for pilots. Uh, not only, uh, you know, for everybody to get a more diverse workforce, allow people that traditionally wouldn't be able to get into the workforce ability to get funding uh, is essential. And again, we support your, your efforts on that front. 
Uh, thank you. And, and speaking of workforce, pilots can't fly with the, out the air traffic controllers managing um, those runways, right? And all the other things that they look at in the skies. And I, I know there's been a major issue uh, facing air traffic controllers for many years under staffing, right? And so workforce attrition, there's lengthy training periods, there's forced early retirement, uh, coupled with the stop and go funding we've had with sequestration. It really had a lasting negative effect in our air traffic control um, workforce and, and really also including on hiring and retaining that uh, talent. They perform a very highly complex, uh, high stress job. It requires quick decision making and we can't afford to go without these hard worker, hard working, well trained, dedicated um, individuals. As part of the government funding bill last year, NACTA worked with members of Congress to address this hiring shortage by reinstating the retired military controller program. And uh, we're very proud of that. And so, uh, Mr. Ram, can you tell us how reinstating this program is helping to alleviate the staffing shortage of air traffic controllers and, and uh, um, what other ways, again, you might consider that we would do to build a pipeline either from the military or otherwise to uh, build out our nation, our civilian control towers? Mr. Ram. Uh, thank you, Senator. I didn't realize it was addressed to me. I, my, yes, focus, my focus is more on the commercial aircraft industry and the subsystem manufacturers, but I, I would like to get back to you after conferring with my colleagues, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. If anyone has any anything they'd like to uh, mention about air traffic controllers, I, I'm glad to, uh, well, I guess now my time's about up. We can take that off the record. I just think that it's a really important part of our workforce that uh, we need to uh, continue to uh, see thrive and grow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, my time's up. Or Madam Chair, sorry, Senator Duckworth. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, we now recognize Senator Peters also remotely. Oh, no. Nope. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Vance. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so I, I want to start just by, you know, we've heard a lot already about workforce shortages, and I know that's not a new conversation. This is going to be directed uh, to, to Captain Ambrose. Um, we haven't heard as much, or at least not since I've been paying attention, about the role of the vaccine mandates in, in the pilot shortage. And look, I, I, I'm not asking this question to point fingers or to attack anybody, but I'd like just an, an honest explanation and, and conversation here about what the vaccine mandates did to our pilot workforce. And obviously, Captain Ambrose, you're the, you're the right person to answer this question, but could you walk me through what effect that had, whether we're still feeling it today? Uh, well, thank you, Senator. Uh, and I know it's more about the vaccine. Maybe at the end, if I have time, I could address some of the, the fallacies with the with the pilot shortage uh, thing going on out here. But the uh, the facts are, it, when the vaccine happened, every airline handled it differently. Uh, we know some airlines actually did, did the mandate. Other airlines, uh, I collaborated with my airline at the time to to make sure that 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 pilots and other employees could uh, have a, a reasonable accommodation. So we successfully came to an agreement where we incentivized the vaccine, but no employees got terminated. So there was zero effect at, at, that, at, at our carrier for that. On an on a industry as a whole, um, most people uh, did either get vaccinated, so it was a very small, very small percentage. So I would say that, that the vaccination process itself and, and where we are today has, has very little effect at, at where we are. I think the fact that, uh, you know, honestly, the fact that, that Many pilots and other workers got out of the out of the business during COVID, uh, early retired, whether they were vaccinated or not, early retired. The fact that airlines uh, bumped a lot of pilots down to slower paying equipment, smaller equipment because didn't know what was going to happen and how fast the recovery was going to be. And then this this massive training backlog we're dealing with right now, um, which is working its way through, but that massive training backlog is coming back the other direction. Um, is really what's the, the, the root of why we're not flying pre-pandemic let off. But, but to be clear, the, the airlines have more pilots today than they had pre-pandemic, but they're not operating as many flights. That is because of this massive training backlog, which is working through. The, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. The flight schoolers are full. We have more pilots. We have more airline transport pilot certificates issued. 
uh, last year than, than in history, more than are required. So airlines make economic decisions as to why they don't serve smaller communities. Uh, there are a lot of small airplanes parked. Those airplanes aren't coming back even if, you know, there was yeah. a, a surplus. Can I just follow up on the training requirement real quick? And then I want to ask a question to Mr. Sparrow just about, about what we've done with our maintenance staff and, and, and outsourcing. But so, so, so really quickly, just because I have limited time, um, I've heard a lot and I've, in fact, had private conversations with airline executives who've encouraged us to relax the 1,500-hour standard in, in flight. And I recognize you don't like that idea, uh, Mr. Ambrose, and, and that's 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 fine. I don't, you know, I, I don't I don't know, um, and I, that's part of the reason I'm asking. But maybe to try to to square the circle a little bit, one of the arguments I've also heard, not just about the number of hours, but is that there's too much rote flying and not enough preparation for sort of crisis situations in some of the flight training do we, that we do. do. Do you think that's right? So 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 let's say, for example, you didn't want to relax the 1500 hour rule. Would you be open to sort of changing the way that those fifteen hours are fifteen hundred hours are composed, such as there was a little bit more focus on crisis response? Do you think that's that's a fair problem? So uh, the fifteen hundred hour rule is a bit of a misnomer. That's the name, but there are other mechanisms. If you are out of the military, it's seven hundred and fifty hours. If you are a four year accredited school where you had advanced academics, it's a thousand hours. If it's a two-year program, it's 1,250 hours. The process is already there. There doesn't need to be a change. There's a, an air carrier rulemaking, the ACT ARC, at the FAA that can study any of those proposals. So there, it's, a, it's a solution in search of a problem because it already is there. The mechanism, if someone's got a great idea, can go to the rulemaking committee and say, hey, here's an alternative means. But to be clear, the, there's, a, there's a fallacy that people are just flying around in circles buying time to build their 1,500 hours. That's not the case. These people are teaching other pilots. They're out there doing commercial work, getting paid to do this. You know, very few pilots have the financial resources to just go buy 1,500 hours worth sure, of flight time. Sure. So these people are contributing to the next generation of pilots right behind them. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Ambrose. And, and, and Mr. Sparrow, given that I'm light on time, I'm going to submit this question to the record. We'll only explain why I'm going to ask this question. So I, I really worry when you see the trends in offshoring and outsourcing a lot of our, of our aircraft maintenance uh, one, I worry about it from the perspective of workers. Obviously, that means that there are American workers who are not doing their, those jobs, not earning those wages, and so forth. But I think given what's going on in the world, we should start to think about this maybe as a national security problem. Uh, if you think about what we're doing, we could very well be training in East Asia a generation of co commercial aviation maintenance people who could be doing military aviation maintenance five years down the road, 10 years down the road in a way that's very, very oppositional to our national security interests. So uh, I'll, I'll submit that question to the record, but that, that's why I'm asking it is I worry about the effect on workers, also worry about the effect on our national security. Thank you, and I yield. Thank you, Senator Vance. And just so you know, I mean, part of the aviation safety bill is for the United States to ha be the leads in those safety standards and then go to ICAO and get those as the international safety standards. That's the best way for us to lead. And that way we would know what those standards had to be adhered to around the globe. We don't want a lesser standard, and uh, but we need the FAA to have the leadership to go do that and to be a very loud voice on that. Senator Welch. And, and Madam Chair, I, I just have to say, you have the best water of all the committees okay. that I've done. I'm the new guy, but you know, let, okay. me, let me say this is good stuff. Okay, good to know. Senator, uh, okay, Senator Peters. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Uh, Von Mullen, uh, in, in Northern Michigan and in uh, the Upper Peninsula in uh, particular, there are many airports that host only a couple of round trip flights per day, often uh, relying on the essential uh, air service program to keep those flights uh, in circulation. Uh, I've heard directly uh, and in very uh, loud terms uh, from community leaders from in Houghton, Marquette, and Sault Ste. Marie about the consequences that uh, recent reductions in regional air service have had uh, to them economically and throughout uh, rural Michigan. I know that Alaska Airlines flies several EAS routes uh, in Alaska. And uh, my question for you is, uh, based, based on that experience, can you speak to how critical essential air service program is to maintaining the economic strength of uh, rural communities, and given the challenges that airports served by the programs had faced uh, since the pandemic, uh, are there steps that you think uh, Congress should take to, to strengthen that program? 
Certainly, Senator Peters. Thank you for the question. Um, we understand that essential air service and air service in general is critical to the infrastructure of uh, where we fly. In this case, for us, EAS is in the state of Alaska, but also to rural communities in the state of Washington, Montana, Idaho, and in your case, Michigan. Uh, we're committed to the communities that we're flying to today because we understand how critical it is to support those communities. And in fact, what I would say the solution is we're meeting here today to work across entities to solve the workforce problem that we will have in the future as the workforce ages and uh, retires. And then we're also going to want to grow. Um, so uh, the solutions we bring forth today will be important to implement. Great. Thank you. Dr. Liddy, th thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you uh, for your work uh, on the Women in Aviation Advisory Board. Uh, your fellow board member and uh, Michigander, Kelly uh, Yost, uh, told me about uh, the work uh, that your board did to encourage uh, recruitment and retention of women in various uh, aviation uh, uh, fields, uh, who astonishing, uh, astonishing to me represent uh, fewer than 5% of airline pilots and 3% of aviation mechanical folks. Uh, and I don't think we can expect, a, in my mind, a strong uh, and resilient pilot and aviation workforce without working towards better uh, representation uh, from uh, women uh, in the workforce. That's why I'm preparing to introduce Promoting Women in Aviation Act uh, next week to codify the Women uh, in Aviation Advisory Board. And I would like you uh, to speak uh, to the importance of establishing a permanent committee to continue your work to improve recruitment and retention of women uh, in the industry and how uh, that uh, will certainly uh, benefit the flying public. Certainly. First of all, thank you. We're excited to hear when our recommendations are in action. So, um, and we consider that a, a high priority recommendation out of out of our board report. And the reason for that is, you know, we identified in the report this complex system of barriers. So there's no one quick fix. There's no one easy answer to increase those data numbers that you just um, discussed and presented. So in order to make sure that we continue on the path to make change and implement those recommendations. Um, we find it necessary to call for the um, permanent advisory committee to do so. And the focus of that committee will just make sure we get it done. Let's stay on target. Let's make sure the recommendations get implemented. But to me, I actually see some additional benefits to that board beyond just our wish to get it done, which obviously we have. Um, but that board will bring together people from a wide variety of disciplines within aviation, if you will. So we're going to you know, hope to have industry and nonprofits and labor um, and just a broad perspective brought together. And what that allows us to do is a couple of things. It also allows us to keep an eye out for additional future changes and watch what's happening in the industry so we can stay ahead and keep ahead of the workforce issues. But also the opportunity to share best practices and collaborate amongst those groups. As I said earlier, there's great work going on. Um, it would It's beneficial to us to bring those groups together in order to share best practices and collaborate to make the most of it. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Mr. Monathan, uh, we have uh, several uh, excellent flight schools in Michigan that are doing all they can to make sure that we have a uh, strong aviation uh, and uh, pilot uh, workforce. Uh, but one of those programs, Northwestern Michigan College, has a backlog of students waiting to matriculate through their pilot program, but they're unable to acquire additional training uh, aircraft uh, due to a shortage uh, of training aircraft. Uh, my office has spoken with training aircraft manufacturers to begin to understand the supply chain difficulties and, and its impact on an aviation workforce. And uh, so my, my question for you is, can you expand on some of the root causes of these types of manufacturing and supply chain challenges and how that's impacting our ability to train uh, pilots because of a shortage of aircraft? Yeah, uh, thank you, Senator, for asking the question. Um, I can speak to the supply chain aspect of it, specifically regarding the availability of training aircraft or not. I, I, have, I do not have information on that. Okay. Specifically, if you look at um, aircraft manufacturing and the parts available for either to produce or to maintain the aircraft, we do have a massive challenge right now. You know, the two biggest challenges that the industry deals with <coughs> is one, supply chain, and the second one is talent. <coughs> and talent actually feeds into the supply chain. And this goes all the way into the sub tiers because a larger company may be able to hire employees and because, you know, based on what the compensation requirements are as well as the brand. But if you look at the sub-tier space where they make the specific components for aircraft, even a training aircraft, for example, I think that is a challenge. You know, there are 
you know, struggling to attract talent that could be impacting. But uh, specifically, the lack of availability of the aircraft, I cannot speak on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator, Senator Welch. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for the hearing. And I want to really thank all of the witnesses. We seem to have really very strong bipartisan recognition that there's a lot of work to be done in order to maintain uh, the skies being safe and sound. We've got to do everything we can for the uh, pilots, uh, for the flight crews, uh, for the airport workers. That's the baggage handlers. It's the folks who clean up. I mean, it's when you think about showing up uh, to get on the plane and you want, as a flyer, to take it for granted that everything is going to work, uh, that doesn't happen by accident. It's an incredible amount of effort. So thank you very much. And I, just as an example of how those protocols and training go into place, I just want to uh, describe an incident that happened in Vermont just this past week. Uh, airline was flying in. Somebody left a note uh, in the uh, lavatory saying that the, there was a bomb on the plane. Uh, alarming. And there were protocols in place. That was made known to the pilot. They were about 20 minutes out. Uh, and then procedures were followed. The plane landed, all the ground person, and was isolated. And uh, the various <clears throat> safety personnel all did exactly what they were supposed to do. Good news, no bomb. But also good news, there was a clear set of protocols that well-trained people were able to follow and provide maximum safety and immediate response. And I just want to express as a flyer, uh, and as one of the people who takes for granted that things are going to work, uh, and that when things don't work, there's going to be protocols to address it and make it right, thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I do want to ask Mr. Sparrow just to give you an opportunity. What steps can we take in Congress to meet the needs of aviation safety specialists and other airline employees, including that uh, ensuring that airports are adequately staffed and workers uh, have the support they need? Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, with regard to the aviation safety specialists that work in the field, what would help very much is if the FAA would uh, begin to use a uh, valid technical operations staffing model. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, right now, the data that's being used is, is flawed. Uh, the, the work that our folks do needs to be uh, set forth in a workforce plan, uh, setting us up for this decade and beyond, quite frankly. The opportunity to uh, give our folks uh, in the field and, and give, the, uh, give the aviation community the ability to move forward uh, with the national airspace system that can move into, the next, in, into that next decade uh, is critical. So Congress so can help by... standards that are modern and updated. Yes, sir. Makes, I, uh, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, Captain Ambrosi, what can we do here in Congress uh, in the upcoming FAA reauthorization bill? Uh, to support pilots and establish initiatives that recruit, train, and retain pilots and other aviation workers. I mean, we're having a shortage in labor there as we are in so many sectors in the economy. And I know one person said on-the-job training or while you're going to school getting some training makes sense to me, but uh, give you an opportunity to respond to that. Well, a pilot profession would be a hard one to do on-the-job training while you're while you're going to school. So we'll, we'll probably push back on that one a little bit. But anyway, the thank you for the question. Um, there are, flight schools are full. The pipeline is, is there. But we, I encourage and support the, the committee's actions on funding for, for flight training. It's very expensive. Um, <clears throat> allows underrepresented groups, females, minorities, to get, in, to get into this, this business. Because as I said earlier, um, at the cost today, I wouldn't be sitting here. It's, 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 far, too, uh, it's far more expensive, and, and inflation has killed flight training. So and it, you know, there's reasons for that, but we need to make it more accessible to folks through, through funding. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. And we miss Senator Leahy tomorrow, so we appreciate you wearing the green. Thank you very much, Senator Welch. Senator Sinema. Oh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for joining us today. When thinking about the aviation industry, safety must always remain our most important priority and the ultimate focus of our efforts. Rewarding aviation careers are essential to ensure continued American leadership on aviation safety. That's why I chaired an aviation subcommittee field hearing in Goodyear, Arizona last May 
to explore how to develop the pipeline for 21st century aviation careers. The issues we explored nearly a year ago in sunny Arizona are key questions for Congress as the aviation economy rapidly expands and modernizes. Now, the statistics are staggering and worth repeating. 94% of pilots are male and 93% are white, but that's not the whole story. Less than 3% of aviation mechanics are women, and there's been less than a 1% change in the rate of women serving in these roles over recent decades. In fact, it's estimated that less than 20% of all aviation-related jobs are held by women. Now, I was excited that the Aviate Academy in Goodyear, Arizona, has the goal to have more than half of their class be women or people of color. Congress has taken steps to address this challenge, including establishing the Women in Aviation Advisory Board in the Federal Aviation Administration reauthorization in 2018. But clearly, more must be done. So I have two questions for Dr. Ludi. First, where do you see Congress having the greatest ability to help reach women and other traditionally underrepresented communities in the aviation space? And second, are there particular federal legislative programs, whether in aviation or otherwise, that Congress has passed that could serve as models or be expanded to help these populations enter the aviation workforce? Yes, um, thank you for that. I, I will say um, to your first question, what can what can be done? Um, certainly, again, I think, as you mentioned, that um, more work has to be done in this area. So establishing that permanent advisory committee will allow us to continue that work um, or allow the committee, I should say, to continue that work and focus on getting those uh, recommendations implemented to address um, the gaps in representation in aviation. Um, in terms of, of examples for Congress and what they can do, um, uh, you know, certainly funding. You know, we're we'll, we're going to say it again because it's such a key issue. Um, but cost of training is absolutely a barrier, and um, so work that can be done to enhance access to financial aid and um, assistance for flight training costs um, is certainly going to help make a dent and assist us. Um, so cost is a, is a big part of the issue. Uh, other examples of workforce development grants. Um, I think, again, continuing, extending, expanding those grants so that we can continue to do the outreach and other good work um, that needs to be done. And all of those areas are um, recommendations within the advisory board report. So we would encourage uh, Congress to um, enact those recommendations. Thank you. As many of you pointed out in your testimony, it's no secret that individuals face considerable challenges due to the high costs of aviation education and training. The hosts of our hearing last year on the aviation workforce, United Aviate Academy in Goodyear, is the first flight school wholly owned by a major airline. We were able to learn about some of their innovative techniques like public and private partnerships that they're using to financially support aviation training, particularly for those with the most need. I know that other carriers like Alaska and American are also working to lessen pilot and other training costs through initiatives and partnerships. So Ms. Von Mullen, has Alaska been successful in cutting the cost of pilot training? And what have you found to be the most effective strategy to address these costs? Thank you for, for the question, Senator. Alaska has invested in uh, the Ascend Pilot Academy to provide financial assistance, mentorship, and in fact, a career path uh, to becoming a pilot. We've also invested in the True North Pilot Development Program, which in fact our pilots came up with to suggest and uh, start a uh, pilot development program for students in uh, an HBCU um, colleges. One is Delaware State and the other is the University of Maryland, East Eastern Shore, where we provide, again, financial support and um, a mentorship to uh, folks to become pilots. Those outreach programs, those financial support programs to um, traditionally less represented communities are criti critical to reach the numbers in workforce uh, growth that we will need looking forward as our workforce ages, and we uh, c expect to continue to grow. Well, thank you. You know, there's a range of opinion about pilot supply in the aviation labor market more broadly. Some have argued there's a shortage, while others disagree strongly with that. I want to take a broader perspective. Public and private studies uh, all raise key questions around attrition, the impact of technology, and the availability of qualified labor. So, Captain Ambrosi and then Ms. Von Mullen, what are your perspectives on the long-term outlook for pilot demand and whether we're prepared to meet it? Well, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, we're meeting the demand right now. Uh, there's, there's a lot of talk around a pilot shortage. 
Uh, airlines make decisions to support uh, to fly to markets based on economics. Uh, a lot of you'll see some of the major airlines in our country have said that they're going to do away with the 50 seat RJ. So there's numbers about how many RJs are parked or small airplanes are parked out there, and it's because of a pilot shortage. Well, those airplanes aren't coming back. Um, they they will make a decision to serve a market based on uh, its profitability, as they are for profit businesses. Uh, I, Apple completely supports working with Congress on uh, improving uh, essential air service funding to, to make sure that these markets do it. The point is that special interests would like to uh, make an argument that we should roll back uh, pilot training and, and safety requirements in order to make our costs cheaper in or, or, order to serve those smaller markets. I will tell you that, that, that passengers um, in, in those markets deserve the same level of safety regardless of how big their, their city is. Um, as anybody that flies out of a, a major city. So uh, we absolutely are proposed to rolling back. Pilots are in the pipeline. We are in a training backlog, but we're, we're getting caught up. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, at Alaska Airlines, we're back to our 2019 levels of flying currently. Uh, the problem is a long-term problem because the lead time to becoming a captain at a regional carrier and then a captain at a mainline carrier is so long, in years. Uh, two and a half years to become a, a captain at a regional carrier once you're hired there as a first officer, and then a, a similar, if not longer, time frame for mainline carrier, just to be clear, the, the, the pinch point is at regional carriers. And so being ahead of this uh, workforce problem and um, uh, working ahead because of the long lead time is actually ap uh, absolutely critical, and I'm glad we're discussing it today. Chairwoman Thank you, Chair. Senator Cantwell. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is such an important issue. It wasn't what I was going to ask questions about, but I do want to bring up the point. I mean, this committee just passed a major infrastructure investment bill and a Chips and Science Act, and it is about allowing innovation to happen in more places than just San Francisco and Seattle. It is about the unleashing of the innovation economy across the United States. Well, I guarantee you, you have to have airports. Some, some number, I don't know whatever. It's a high number. It's like 80% of all economic development happens within 10 miles of an airport. So we're going to figure out how to get this. And I don't know that it's going to be all essential air service. I don't know. But Wenatchee deserves to have air cover, and so does other places throughout the United States that represent these markets. They represent, Wenatchee is our Apple economy. And they have to have coverage, and so do other places. I know if I don't know if my colleague Senator Thune has been here, but he's been um, big on this. And so we can't um, let uh, what I would call key economic engines at smaller airports across the United States be strangled because of the pilots. We've got to figure out a solution. Okay, uh, Captain Broja, I did want to ask about yesterday and what happened at our the safety summit that was held and the NTSB investigating six close calls at runways around the country and investigating two wrong way landings last year and two separate severe turbulence incidents in the same day um, in Hawaii last December. So we heard from the NTSB chairwoman, uh, Han Hamady, about what she's referring to. One of the things the committee also did in the safety bill was to say we want trend reports. We, we want to know, we here want to understand the trends so that we can do a, our oversight job. So what NTSB is saying is there are open FAA issues that uh, are recommendations about what should be implemented because of these patterns, these troubling patterns of near misses. For example, NTSB has called for an expanded use of technology, air service detection systems, which is Model X, or airport service surveillance capability, ASSC, which helps the air traffic controller track the movement of aircraft and vehicles that would interfere um, with runway operations. It also alerts controllers when a plane is landing, is lining up on a, to land on a taxi away instead of a runway, they get an alert. This technology is currently used at 44 airports across the country, including at JFK, where the ASDEX helped avoid a collision on January 13th. Uh, so we have this technology at SeaTac, and since its implementation since 2018, it's prevented pilots from mistakenly landing in the wrong direction. This is according to data 50 different occasions. So I want to ask you, um, uh, 
Captain Ambrosia, do you believe that implementing the ST NTSB recommendations for runway safety technology could enhance safety at airports? Yes or no? Yes, there's no doubt. It's uh, it's related to funding. So okay. Should we establish a requirement for airplanes landing at primary airports to be equipped with systems that alert pilots when an airplane is not aligned on the runway? Yes or no? There's so many advancements in technology. Technology, pilots embrace technology. So anything that helps make our job safer, we, we absolutely support. Mandate technology for cockpit systems that provides and alerts pilots when an airplane plane is not aligned with the intended runway surface for landing at primary airports. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I think, um, I think this is where we are. Uh, requiring all airports which schedule passenger service a ground improvement safety system that will prevent runway incursions and provide direct warning capabilities to flight crew. Yes. Again, it's re related to funding. We support broad-based funding to the to the FAA. It's not just these specific items. They need, they have a long-term plan. They need funding for N national airspace improvements. We have all these new operators coming in with UAS. It's a it's a broader topic than than just ground surveillance. But that's a start. Absolutely. Well, I think I think what we're seeing here and and feeling across these many stories is that we have to have the highest safety standards, and we have to have the investment in modern equipment that is going to give us those safety standards. Absolutely. So that is what we were going to be pushing for here. Um, I also wanted to uh, ask, you know, specifically, you know, on the workforce side, my, my colleague here who's chairing our hearing this morning has the Troop Talent Act. Um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Van Mulen about uh, what you guys, what Alaska has been doing to try to get that workforce. But what I feel like we need to do is we, we're, we're almost there. We're not quite there. There's, there's still something missing between DOD and commercial carriers on how to take this workforce and get them delivered. Senator, absolutely. Uh, streamlining the pipeline is, is essential with regards to cert certification, for example, but also uh, expanding GI GI, the GI Bill to support um, uh, more careers in aviation and specifically pilots. Um, the funding, um, increasing the funding in that area would be beneficial to facilitate that transition. Yeah, I'm going to let uh, Senator Duckworth talk a little bit more about her experience for the record. I really want it on the record. But she's saying, as a military person, she got the training that was cons consistent with what would give her the education on the outside while she was in the military. So now, as I believe we these people come out, they don't have that relevant, it doesn't translate, and then we're doing an FAA one-off certificate for every single person to see if they qualify or not qualify. We need a more standardized system. But one of the reasons why I support Phil Washington is because I feel like He's not going to go along with the group think of everything's okay. He's someone coming from the outside. Um, but on this issue of workforce, which is the issue here and is the issue writ large in the FAA, I feel like at his hearing, he talked about this was one of his main objectives, which I was glad to hear. Um, I feel like this is our best shot right now at a workforce, is to get the DOD people that are practically trained to get the training, whatever it is, so that they can move into the commercial space. Is this our best opportunity? I think absolutely. The uh, What I was referring to is people who are not yet pilots uh, in the military uh, benefiting from GI loans to become yes. a pilot uh, outside of the military. But yes, Senator. Yeah, okay, great. And, and Captain Ambrosia, do you support Mr. Washington? Thank you for the question. The FAA needs long-term stable leadership. I've had a conversation with Mr. Washington. I would like to say I appreciate his commitment to safety, his commitment to um, standards, and his commitment to keeping pilots in the flight deck. I, I believe that, that Mr. Washington can be an effective FAA administrator. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the hearing, Madam Chair. I think we have a lot of work to do. The witnesses have given us a lot of thought. Look, this is a problem we can solve. But um, as, as you said, we can't lower the standards. And in, in, in many cases, I think we've seen here that we need to raise the standards. But we have to figure out how to build this pipeline more successfully and give American cities really access to good aviation 
uh, access so that they can continue. They can't be held hostage to an airline that just wants to pay dividends. We, we have to get the system right and get air transportation right, and that will help America overall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairwoman uh, Cantwell. Um, so I'm, before I recognize Senator Hinkenlooper, I, I wanted to make this statement that she's asked me to make <clears throat> describing how I received my FAA uh, uh, airman certificates. Uh, basically, when I was going through flight school, um, an FAA regional office administrator came in and talked to the class and said, if any of you want to get your FAA commercial instrument rotorcraft license, take the weekend, come to this course, intensive 12 hours, two days, um, at the end of which we took the written test for the commercial pilot test. When we did that, upon graduation from flight school at Fort Rucker, Alabama, I received my FAA license as a commercial instrument rotorcraft pilot. Um, I was one of maybe four who took the time to go do that, and the rest of my class did not. So what we have here is a problem, and this is what I was trying to do with my Troop Talent Act, is that the DOD schoolhouse did not set aside the time, didn't want to set aside the time of an additional two or three days to allow the FAA to come in, teach the classes, because what you needed to be able to pass that commercial um, test was not what we were getting as Black Hawk pilots in the Army. So you needed to still be able to meet the FAA licensure requirements. Um, but the DOD did not provide that space for that testing to happen. And so it's on the individual to take time, your time off to go do that and pay additional the, the testing fees. What was good was that the FAA regional office had this agreement at Fort Rucker, Alabama, this one place to provide that. And so when I graduated, from the time that I graduated, every flight hour I flew as a military pilot counted towards my FAA totals. Now, my, co my colleagues who did not do that then had to use a GI Bill or whatever it is to go and take all of the you know, flight training and take all of the check rides and all of that to get their commercial pilot uh, license. And then they started logging time as commercial pilots when they had all this time flying a complex aircraft, you know, dual engine complex aircraft. And so this is the type of thing we need to work out. We've solved this for the CDL. I, Senator Solomon mentioned this earlier. Um, because we now uh, work with the individual secretaries of state in each of the, in, of the states to provide a CDL to someone who graduates from the military truck driving school so that when they graduate from truck driving school and they get the military driver's license for a tractor trailer driver, they also get a CDL. Um, so that no longer do you have people who are driving military tractor trailers for 200,000 miles in combat being told, sorry, you have no over-the-road experience as far as the Secretary of State is concerned. you got to waste your GI Bill money, go do that, and now you're still shown as having no experience when you actually drove 200,000 miles under enemy fire. So we got to figure this out. And same with um, mechanics, right? Just because you're, you, grow, you, you, you graduated from crew chief school doesn't mean you're a qualified A&P mechanic because there's additional requirements. And you should, we should make that space with the NEOD. So we, let's work on the pipeline. I work with my colleagues. We might come to you to see what we can do to, to try to get that. And it may be individual schools, civilian commercial schools, that would be willing to work with the various flight schools that exist within the military to provide that certification and that testing. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, recognize Senator Hinkenlooper. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank all of you for your commitment, your public service, um, all the work that you do to keep our, our aviation system safe and efficient. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what um, uh, Chairman Cantwell had mentioned uh, with Captain Ambrosi uh, in terms of uh, Phil Washington's nomination to run the FAA. And there's been a lot of discussion, and I've known Phil Washington for almost 20 years, so I'm a, a big fan I think his integrity, you know, his drive to get things done is unmatched. Uh, but there's been a lot of discussion that, that, that we would that we had to have a or someone had to have a we had to have a pilot in that position, and that's you don't view that as a, a, a requirement. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, there have been past FAA administrators that have not been pilots that have 
have been successful. It's essential that you have experience running a large organization and you can, can do so. Um, it is important that, that if you are not a pilot, you reach out to the, the stakeholders and, and include them. And um, Mr. Washington has given us that commitment that he will, he will absolutely um, um, do that. Great. Uh, I appreciate that. And I know from experience, having watched him do that, that, do that very thing, that he will reach out and make sure that everyone's involved in the conversation and uh, there's a real collaborative approach to solving some of the challenges you all face. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Luddy, um, uh, you know, in Colorado, like so many parts of this country, regional air service is essential. Um, rural communities can't thrive without uh, a connection to the rest of the world. Uh, Colorado and many Western states rely on regional flights that cover long, relatively long distances uh, to hub airports like Denver uh, so that people can get to the hub and then get to their ultimate destination. Um, in terms of the workforce, and there's been a lot of discussion on this committee around the, the lack of a robust and diverse uh, uh, aviation workforce, in terms of the uh, reliability of flights serving rural communities, do you think that, there's, that, that, that that diversity has a real benefit to the, the reliability of flights? Well, thank you. I think the foundation of aviation is having that strong, highly trained professional workforce to deliver services throughout the country um, to all kinds of markets, large and small. And as a part of that, you know, women have contributed to that workforce and can contribute, continue to do so. And I think through the recommendations in the report, um, we'll be able to attract and retain more women um, to continue to provide, uh, assist in providing those services. Great, thank you. Um, uh, and Ms. Van Mullen, uh, the, the large regional uh, commercial airlines and the, the, the major airlines, um, I mean, we've heard throughout this hearing and, and in previous hearings the, the workforce needs and how significant they are for pilots and aviation mechanics. Um, you know, as airlines begin to launch their own dedicated training academies to grow the aviation pipeline, um, the question then is how can we, uh, you know, in addition to the federal efforts we're already making, you've already discussed, um, how can we do more to help commercial airlines, uh, let's say in terms of scholarships or apprenticeships, uh, to, to lower barriers to entry and ma make sure that we are expanding not just the aviation workforce, but getting more, pe more, more diversity in that workforce as we expand? Senator, thank you for the question. It's in fact critical that we expand our pipeline um, in order to meet the requirements of the future. So we're particularly proud at Alaska that we have started a program like uh, the True North Pilot Development Program where we partner with uh, students and uh, help develop students at the uh, University of Delaware, sorry, the um, Delaware State University and University of Maryland Eastern Shore. We provide a stipend and uh, development funds for individuals uh, at uh, historically black colleges and universities to become pilots. We mentor them along the way. Our own pilot team came up with this idea and are uh, directly involved in mentoring these students, providing them internships. So for sure, the loans and um, uh, to bear, is a barrier to entry, and I would say beyond that, the um, grants for uh, workforce development, because reaching back into the middle and high school years is the place that you uh, spark the passion for aviation and provide the, the breadcrumbs to that career. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, I'm down to eight seconds, so I'll, I'll, I've got a couple more questions I'll put forward in writing. Uh, and you can answer them at your leisure. Thank you all, again, for being here and for all your work to, to make our aviation system the, the global model that it is. Yield back to the chair. Thank you. We now recognize Senator Warnock. Thank you so very much, Senator Duckworth. Uh, as my colleagues on the committee have heard me say before, I believe Georgia is this country's most important aviation state. Uh, Georgia is home, after all, to Delta Airlines and the world's busiest airport in Atlanta's uh, Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport. According to the Georgia Department of Economic Development, aerospace products are both the state's top export and its second largest manufacturing industry, one that is responsible for an annual economic impact of over $57 billion. 
Most importantly, Georgia's aviation industry employs more than 108,000 people spread across more than 800 different companies. But as we've heard today, there is a severe, a severe workforce shortage uh, affecting our aviation industry, something that should concern all of us. Uh, Dr. Ludi, what can Congress do to encourage the growth, the expansion, and development of the aviation workforce? And do educational institutions of all levels have a role to play here? Most certainly educational institutions play a critical role. So um, as we've heard, one of the key areas is making sure that everybody knows we're here and that aviation is a great field to consider and not just pilots, but across the board, introducing young people to the many different careers in aviation. We can absolutely do that through the K through 12 system by introducing curriculum at a very early age in grade school. Make sure we keep students engaged with curriculum being introduced throughout. And then in the high school level, there's great high school programs that already exist, but also taking the opportunity to partner with um, colleges, universities, and technical programs for dual credit and other opportunities. So I think that segment plays a critical role in um, creating awareness of aviation careers to build the workforce for the future. I agree. And uh We've got to foster a well-trained aviation workforce, which means we've got to invest in aviation education. And uh, that starts you know, in, in grade school uh, and beyond, which is why I fought to secure funding for Middle Georgia State University School of Aviation in last year's appropriations package, which they are using now to purchase a flight simulator to train more pilots at Georgia's only, Georgia's only public flight school. That's also why I'm proud to be working on aviation workforce legislation to help more schools, including state and technical colleges, train students from rural communities, non-traditional communities to work in the aviation industry at a lower cost. We, we have to broaden the pool. Uh, I, I believe that the current workforce shortage presents a once in a generation opportunity to revitalize our aviation workforce and industry from the ground up. We ought to uh, see this not only as a, a challenge, but an opportunity. The entire education system has an important role to play in not just addressing the shortage, but also growing and supporting a modern and representative aviation workforce. We need all of our people to get to where we need to go. So the aviation workforce continues to lag behind other industries. There's no question about that. Uh, when it comes to recruiting workers from underrepresented backgrounds, which I propose contributes to the current workforce shortage. The vast majority of aircraft pilots, still the flight engineers, mechanics, technicians, all come from similar backgrounds. Conversely, a much smaller percentage of the aviation workforce come from low-income or rural communities, uh, identify as women, or as people of color. Uh, Mr. Spiro and Dr. Utash, would strengthening and expanding the pool of potential aviation workers help address the current workforce shortage, yes or no? Senator, thank you for the question, yes. Uh, I would add, with regard to the FAA, it would be important to have those jobs available, which means that they need to staff that workforce and have the, have the proper staffing models to identify what employees they need and how many. Dr. Utash? Absolutely, yes. Uh, the more females, the more underrepresented populations, people of color that we can get into, this workforce will help solve So, so those are, are not competing objectives. No. One actually facilitates the other. That's correct. Correct? If so, what types of schools and training programs do you think are most likely to produce an aviation workforce that reflects our country? So I would just point to something that we've just recently done that I think makes a big difference. Uh, we've created a Future Ready Center for uh, juniors and seniors in high school from our largest uh, school district in Wichita and largest school district in Kansas, actually. And those students are being able to begin their careers as juniors and seniors, and many of them are graduating with their high school diploma and their college, their WSU Tech certification and or Associate of Applied degree at the same exact time. So coming in May, they will be graduates of both, 
and they're ready to be workforce ready at that point in time, particularly in uh, manufacturing and aviation maintenance. Those kind of programs are the kind of programs that are really going to you know, advance the workforce. We're very fortunate in the state of Kansas that we have what we call a, a program in Excel and CTE, where our state is picking up the tuition for those high school students. So they come out with all of their preparation to go to work with no student loan debt. That's a great program. And then you look at um, driving that in. Our, our Wichita school system is, is, is full of underrepresented uh, a very ethnic diverse population. So that particular program is meeting both an immediate workforce effort, reducing student loan, and also hitting on females and underrepresented populations. Very good, Mr. Spiro, you want? I have nothing order? to add with that, oh. well said. Great, so, so the aviation workforce development legislation that I'm working on right now will grow and strengthen the entire industry by educating and recruiting a vibrant and diverse workforce with emphasis on training tomorrow's aviation workers who are currently underrepresented uh, in the industry. All of us have a stake in, in this. I look forward to working with the committee to ensure this year's FAA reauthorization includes critical workforce development provisions that further develop and sustain the industry. Thank you all so very much uh, for your testimony and, and thanks to all of our witnesses for your participation today. The hearing record will remain open for four weeks until April 13th, 2023. Any senators that would like to submit questions for the record should do so two weeks from now by March 30th, 2023. And we ask that all witnesses <clears throat> complete their responses and return them to the committee by April 13, 2023. That concludes today's hearing.